a classroom. And then, of course, he went into hiding Still as a is in hiding. of all of this. Uh, the question is, how best do you deal with this extremism threat? Is the suggestion of an exclusion zone, a buffer zone banning protest, the best way to do that? We'll be speaking live to Dame Zara Khan herself in just a few moments' time, but we want your views on that issue. How do we best tackle the extremism, particularly, perhaps, extremism that affects our children? Yes, but first, let's get your headlines. Emily, thank you and good afternoon. The top stories from the GB Newsroom. The Prime Minister says the UK is taking measures to protect itself from the epoch-defining challenge of an increasingly assertive China, he says. It's after recent cyber attacks which saw hackers access millions of voters' personal details and target MPs and peers who've been critical of Beijing. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden is due to address Parliament later over the threats, with the Prime Minister insisting the government will stop at nothing to protect the British public. We've been very clear that the situation now is that China is behaving in an increasingly uh, assertive way abroad, authoritarian at home, and it represents an epoch-defining challenge uh, and also the greatest state-based threat to our economic security. So it's right that we take measures to protect ourselves, which is what we are doing. To give some specific examples, we've used our new national security investment powers to block investment from China into sensitive technology sectors like semiconductors, our National Security Act and others means that we can take any other steps that we need to. A £200 million package of investment aimed at securing the future of the country's nuclear industry has been unveiled. Rishi Sunak has declared a critical national endeavour as he vows to strengthen the nuclear industry and boost jobs. He's introduced a new fund backed by £20 million in public money to support growth in Barrow and Furness, that's the home of Britain's submarine programmes, and a further £180 million a year over the next decade, which Downing Street says will provide grants to local organisations. The huge benefits of, of all of this investment in new technologies, including nuclear, is that we're going to be creating uh, hundreds of thousands of new high-wage, high-skilled jobs, the length and breadth of the country, many in places where high-wage jobs uh, are actually at a premium. And that's why I'm so excited about the investment that we are making today uh, in Sizewell C and Hinkley Point C and a third gigawatt-scale project coming down the line after that and our small modular reactor programme. This is going to create a whole new uh, range of energy technologies to support our transition to uh, become more energy secure and independent. Shadow Wales Secretary Joe Stevens says Labour welcomes the move. It's the first duty of any government to protect the nation and our support for the deterrent is total. You know, it's a cornerstone of national security. So we welcome, at long last, a defence nuclear strategy from the government. We've long argued for ministers to secure jobs in Barrow, for example, and across the submarine supply and into the nuclear sector. Chilling levels of harassment are posing a serious threat to schools. That's according to an independent government adviser. A review led by Dame Sarah Khan will be published today, showing more than 75% of the public feel they can't speak their mind. It suggests many people feel society has become more divisive and cites the case of a teacher who went into hiding after showing a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad during a class. It's understood the report will recommend a series of measures, including a ban on protests within 150 metres of schools. Energy regulator Ofgem says it's to consider a new dynamic price cap based on the time of day households use their energy. It's launched a consultation on a range of options for the future of the price cap, including a more dynamic cap to encourage consumer flexibility. Other options include a targeted cap, which could be based on vulnerability or capping the margin suppliers can make. Thousands of junior doctors in Wales are striking for 96 hours from today. It's the third time they've held strikes this year in their ongoing pay dispute. The industrial action will see appointments at hospitals and GPs postponed across the country. The British Medical Association is arguing for better pay, insisting doctors' salaries have dropped by almost a third in 15 years. 
Tens of thousands of healthcare workers will receive two one-off payments worth up to £3,000 in recognition of the role they play at charities and local authorities. Community nurses, sexual health workers, physiotherapists and other frontline workers at non-NHS organisations are all set to receive the payment. Last year, more than a million NHS staff received two one-off payments alongside a 5% pay rise. The Home Office is launching social media adverts to deter Vietnamese nationals from travelling to the UK illegally on small boats. The government says an increasing number of migrants coming via the channel are from Vietnam. New ads building on similar ones already used in Albania will be written in Vietnamese and set out the risks of being exploited by smuggling gangs who profit from facilitating small boat crossings. More than 14 million Easter getaway trips are expected over the weekend, causing travel disruption for many across the country. The RAC is warning that journeys on popular routes could take twice as long as usual, as the bank holiday weekend leads into a two-week school holiday. Trains will also be stopped as Network Rail carries out engineering works on the West Coast mainline between Good Friday and Easter Monday. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Good afternoon, Britain. It's eight minutes past 12 and the UK is facing an insidious erosion of its democracy due to an inability to cope with extremism. That's the warning of a damning new report written by the counter-extremism advisor, Dame Sara Khan. Now, as part of her review, Dame Sara also makes 15 recommendations to help improve social cohesion and also democratic resilience in Britain. These include the establishment of an exclusion zone for protests outside schools and also a five-year action plan for tackling extremism. But I'm delighted to say that we can now go live to GB News political editor Christopher Hope, who is joined by Dame Sarah Khan herself. Christopher. Tom, Emily, good morning. Yeah, with me now is Dame Sarah Khan, who wrote this report. Uh, Dame Sarah, thank you for joining us today on GB News. You say that three quarters of people can't express their views. What do you mean? So what I describe in my report is this phenomenon called freedom restricting harassment, which is when people experience or witness threatening, intimidatory or abusive harassment, either online or offline, which is then intended to make individuals or institutions self-censor out of fear. And so what our polling shows is that around three quarters of the British public um, feel that they cannot share their personal opinion public out of fear of receiving freedom restricting harassment. And You'll be aware that there's been a lot of debate over the last couple of months, even years, about how parliamentarians and those in public life have been at the forefront of such abuse and harassment. What my report shows for the first time is that this is a much broader phenomenon where people such as academics and teachers, counsellors, journalists, civic society activists, people working in the arts and cultural sector are experiencing this awful kind of freedom-restricting harassment, which is not only stifling individual liberty, but it's undermining social cohesion and erosing democratic rights and freedom freedoms in our society. It's a kind of chilling effect, isn't it, on our democracy? What, what are examples of that, everyday examples? So I spoke to a, a, a former leader of a council, for example, who told me that she has received thousands of death threats directly to her, but also on online forums where people said that they would gang rape and traffic her two-year-old daughter. She makes her two-year-old daughter sleep by a fireproof blanket because a previous councillor had her property firebombed. I mean, that is just one out of many examples I heard. I heard about a civic society um, organization, a director of an NGO of a civic society organization who regularly receives death threats because of her work to counter hate crime um, and how her staff have left their work and jobs because of fear of their lives. She has to change her route to work every day because she fears being attacked. I heard constant examples like this and again across the board from different professions and it's really deeply concerning and it's something we have to do because I worry it is going to erode our, our freedoms. They sound illegal though, making a threat against a two-year-old child to defend Support them, we'll get them out of the country. That, that surely must be an illegal threat. Well, I think many of the cases I saw, I think they are. Um, but what many victims, again, they told me repeatedly 
was that the police are saying this hasn't crossed any criminal threshold. It might be because some of this behaviour is taking place on online forums and is not being sent directly to the victim. That doesn't lessen the impact on victims who are seeing this um, uh, behaviour online that's being directed at towards them. So again, this is why I'm saying, as one of my recommendations to the government, is that all 39 police forces in England should have a police officer who specialises in harassment legislation, malicious communications um, as well, that are able to provide support to victims because they are often overlooked and not necessarily even seen as victims of this, of this harassment. Who are the people making these threats? So that's a very good question, and I'm afraid we don't have the full picture of who these perpetrators are. It is definitely the case that there are extremists, whether far-right Islamists, even Sikh fundamentalists and others who are engaged in this behaviour. But what my evidence is showing is it's a much broader phenomenon. It is not just people who are engaged in extremism. It's people who have a clear intolerance to other people because of their political opinion, because of the job that they do. And they have such a high level of intolerance, they think it's justifiable to send people death threats or rape threats or to engage in doxing behaviour where people upload and share people's personal information as a way to intimidate other people. And I think trying to understand that phenomenon is something we need to do a lot more. And the targets are people in everyday public life, counsellors, school teachers, academics. I think what's so insidious about it is that it's affecting people from all walks of life. So, for example, existing data shows that seven out of ten journalists are afraid to report on certain stories because they are afraid of receiving violence, threats and harassment. Now, that's going to undermine uh, press and journalistic freedom in this country. When nine out of ten counsellors say that they're experiencing harassment and abuse and intimidation, and therefore more than a quarter are unwilling to take office because of that, that's going to restrict the level of representation we have at local government level. You, I can, there are similar figures in the arts and cultural sector and so forth, which is all going to reduce the vibrant life of our, of our plural democracy. That is something we have to stand up and, and push back against. You mentioned now the case of the school in Batley where a teacher had to go into hiding um, for, for uh, discussing and dealing with and looking at a, 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 with the children, a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, how many other Batleys are there? Well, I, I can tell you there have been lots of teachers who've experienced threats and abuse. I mean, I had many teachers contact me describing this level of fear that they have. And there's a new polling out recently that showed that teachers are very fearful about teaching some of these issues because they worry about the backlash that they're going to experience. The problem we have at the moment is, is that the Department for Education don't collect this level of data. So we don't actually know the full scale of it. I think that this is just the tip of the iceberg. When you speak to the NEU and other uh, um, unions that deal with teachers, they have told me that this is a growing problem. So I think this is something we have to tackle. And, you know, let's be clear, this was somebody who was teaching a lesson that was part of the national curriculum, that was signed off by the local authority, and he was hounded out of his job and forced into hiding in our country in the 21st century. That is totally and utterly unacceptable in a free and democratic society like ours. Have you met that teacher? Yes, I have on a number of occasions. And is he still in hiding? And, and is he scared of scared? So he, he is still in hiding. The impact of what happened to him is, I have to say, devastating. It's not just impacted him, it's impacted his family, his children. Um, as I write in the report, he suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder because of, of what happened to him at the time of the incident, which is exactly three years ago today. Um, he felt suicidal, because not only because of the incident and the threats to him, but because of the failure of local agencies and authorities to help him, which compounded his sense of, of, suic of, of suicidal thoughts. On that, and a question from my colleague Michelle Jubry at GB News, should he get compensation? Well, look, that, that's a question for him, really. I don't think I'm the right person to ask him that. That is something, you know, that's something that he, and I hope he's getting legal advice on that. But I just think, looking at this from a much more broader perspective, we have to do far more to support academics, journalists, teachers, people just getting about do, living their lives in our free society to ensure that they are not victims, which is why I'm calling on the government to recognise officially this freedom-restricting harassment and to ensure that we have greater support for victims of freedom-restricting harassment, which includes making sure that the Victims Code recognises um, free victims of freedom-restricting harassment, because, as is the case with the Batley teacher, he was not even seen as a victim of crime, despite his whole life changing overnight, nor was he given any provisions that were set out in the Victims Code.
Is it a question of teaching materials so you can teach uh, about Islam and discuss the Prophet Muhammad and not get these threats? Well, he, let's be very clear about the lesson he was teaching. This was a lesson that was is, is in the national curriculum. The, the curriculum encourages teachers to teach about controversial issues like blasphemy, like free speech. And his whole lesson was about you will inevitably come across things that you find offensive. Now, how do you deal with that? And, and he obviously he was talking about in a democracy, you deal with that through debate and dialogue. What you don't do is engage in threatening and abuse abusive behaviour, which is sadly what exactly happened to him. So again, the, the whole purpose of this debate is, is incredibly important that we cannot allow our differences, no matter how passionate we may feel about some of these issues, that we then descend into a level of extreme threats and violence. That is totally and utterly unacceptable. And I suspect the vast majority of the public would agree with that. Do we need, do you, need you or someone else to set out what, is, what are British values, what are values are acceptable, what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable in this kind of uh, social media age? Well, I think to a certain degree we know what our yeah. values are. I mean, what I make clear in my report is, is that no matter what our differences are, whether, you know, cultural, religious, wider political opinions and beliefs, we are defined in this country by the hard-won rights uh, of democratic rights and freedoms that our country has fought for for centuries. That's what defines us as a, na as a nation. That's what it, it marks us out from authoritarian countries, this vi vibrant, plural democracy where, yes, we may hold different opinions, we may passionately disagree on all kinds of different issues but there comes a point where if you start issuing death threats and rape threats that is totally and un utterly unacceptable and by doing that what we are doing is undermining the very democ democratic norms of our country and it poses a serious threat to our democracy which we must push back against and just finally dame sarah khan you want a new office for social cohesion and democratic resilience uh, will that cost lots of money well, I, I mean, money, how do you put a cost on protecting our democratic rights and freedoms? You know, for, for me, the central problem we have, we have very little intelligence and data on this issue. The government is not collecting. We have no infrastructure in place to deal with these chronic, cohesive threats, these insidious threats that are erosionally, slowly eroding our democratic rights and freedoms. That will affect all of us in this country. It's a basic foundational premise and I think an infrastructure that this country needs. And that's why I'm calling on the government to establish such an office. Well, Dame Sarah Khan, thank you for joining us today on GB News. And you heard there from Dame Sarah. She's very worried about our democracy and the pressures on it and wonders whether the government should do more to look, look after us mm -hmm. all. Back to you. Well, Christopher, thank you so much for bringing that. Really some shocking lines there, that the Batley school issue is just the tip of the iceberg for the problem that could be affecting us across the country. Really, really damning stuff there. Thank you very much for bringing it to us. Thank you, Chris. What a fantastically sensible woman, yes. Dame Sarah Khan seems. And I must say, from what she was saying, it does appear as though overwhelmingly the threat is from Muslim extremists, Islamists. If we take the case of Batley, as she said, that is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to threats over issues to do with religion, religious freedom, uh, blasphemy. Yeah. Clearly, there are lots of people in this country who would like to see some kind of blasphemy law when it comes mm. to the Prophet Muhammad. Or, or, frankly, who don't n sort of see the need for a law because they can sort of deliver it through social pressure, yeah. as we've seen in schools. I mean, wh what I found fascinating is that the number of teachers who have been in contact with uh, Dame Sara, not just those who have experienced sort of the same horrific uh, incidents as, as, as the Batley teacher, but ones who are just self-censoring mm. so that they don't experience that. Uh, ones who, who feel like they can't teach the national curriculum on religious issues and in, our industry, in certain areas. And in our industry, her finding that seven out of ten journalists are worried about writing up some stories or investigating some stories, reporting on them, for fear of harassment, intimidation. And I can certainly see that must be the case for some journalists. If you yeah. want to expose, for example, a hate preacher, Mm. or if you want to expose something that's going on in, in a mosque or, or something like that, there probably is a fear that you may be intimidated out of reporting on that story. Of course, journalists should not be intimidated, but as we've seen, local councils she's talking about, mm. she's talking about teachers, she's talking about journalists, she's talking she, about she even civil cites, servants. She she's even cites about... the case of a liberal imam mm. who had to have police protection because she opposed the burqa. Now, now if, you're, if you're someone who... Is, is yourself a Muslim, but just not a, 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 a very, very conservative Muslim, if you're one of the more, perhaps, reformist 
sort of Muslims, you're just as targeted. Yeah, there are so many um, female Muslims and also ex-Muslims too Yes. Um, who w want to speak out and they also have intimidation. Um, we're going to come back to this uh, later in the show. Let us know your thoughts about what Dame Sarah Khan had to say there. Um, but coming up, we'll be speaking to the MSP, member of the Scottish Parliament, who's threatening to take legal action against Police Scotland because a tweet he posted uh, has been uh, logged as a hate incident. We'll get the lowdown. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3 p.m. Seriously couldn't get my head around it. Electric ambulances. The government are planning to spend our money, over half a billion, on a fleet of electric net zero ambulances. Even being told this alarm bell should be ringing, most of the people I know who have an EV have got rid of it because of the range anxiety and the inconvenience having simply just got too much for them. Frankly, they never do as much as they say they won't, will anyway. First of all, they are totally impractical. The ambulances will take some four hours to charge each, so it will be out of action for that time. They will need space and individual charges and having, and heaven forbid, they need to do more than the 70 to 80 miles capability, which will be somewhat diminished depending on weather conditions and presumably the use of life-saving equipment to keep their patients alive, which I'm guessing will be powered by the same battery. Apparently, the NHS is committed to making all new emergency ambulances electric by 2030 and the entire fleet by 2045. In England alone, this would cost over £600 million. While electric cars don't produce any emissions from the tailpipe, there are emissions involved in the manufacture, as well as the production of the electricity used to charge them. So anyone driving an EV thinking what a great job they're doing needs to think again. Ambulances are usually changed every five years, and at about £150,000 per vehicle, the new EV version would need to be on the road for over 15 to make it commercially viable. So why should the public pay for this? In my view, it's commercially irresponsible and putting our lives at risk for the sake of an ever-questioning green agenda, which will bankrupt the country and is not in the best interest of the patients. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 12.24 and Labour's plan to decarbonise the grid by 2030 could cost taxpayers an extra £116 billion over the next 11 years. That's according to new analysis. Yes, and this is the plan to decarbonise the electricity grid. So it's a different goal from the 2050 net zero goal. This is just about electricity generation. Uh, but Labour's uh, shadow energy secretary has an idea of his own. Take a listen. So my friend is blowing in the wind. The answer... Well, there's Ed Miliband, the Shadow Energy and Net Zero Secretary, um, singing what a an talent. ode, an what a ode talent. to wind turbines, which clearly are part of the answer, but perhaps a larger part of the answer is getting all of this energy about and around the country. Many more uh, transmission towers and the rest of it. Pylons. Pylons. And nuclear stations. Well, let's get the lowdown on it with George Eaton now, the senior politics editor at The New Statesman. And George, thank you for joining us. Uh, th this is a huge number, 116 billion. Is it feasible? Well, Labour's 
always said that much of the investment required to meet that 2030 target will be from the private sector uh, bringing in investment from there rather than simply from government. Because obviously they've already reduced the investment they're promising from 28 billion a year to uh, about 5 billion a year. Uh, they're now promising about 24 billion across the whole of the next parliament. Um, today, Keir Starmer is announcing that the first investment that GB Energy, this new publicly owned energy company, would make would be in offshore wind. And that's uh, an interesting industry to choose because at the moment, here's a revealing stat uh, about almost 45% of the UK's offshore wind capacity is owned by foreign state-owned companies, such as in, in, in Scandinavia. Less than 1% is owned by uh, the UK state. Uh, so this is designed to start shifting that balance. George, net zero has, of course, been a headache for the Conservative Party. Lots of different views. Some Conservative MPs want to scrap the target altogether. But it's also very difficult for Keir Starmer to manage, isn't it, um, in terms of his own party? You've had trade union voices coming out very strongly, talking about where is this green revolution for jobs and talking about how it's very important to make sure that we maintain oil and gas jobs too, crucially. So it's very difficult for Keir Starmer to keep everyone happy. Yes, it is uh, a balancing act. And this, this, this grand green transition is going to define the next decade, not just here, but, uh, but across the West, and it's important that uh, governments do provide support for uh, oil and gas industries in terms of making that that transition. Uh, it's also an opportunity in the terms of the, the jobs it will create, and in the long run, it should um, save save taxpayers money because we've seen actually a renewable energy boom in the, in the UK uh, that's allowed the UK to reduce carbon emissions at a faster rate than other G7 countries. Um, and, and it's, it's well, about it, harnessing that. That's disputable, though, isn't it, whether it will save taxpayers money, because there's been so much analysis of how, actually, I think from Ofgem itself, the uh, energy watchdog, saying that uh, net zero is going to um, hit the poorest the hardest. It all depends, I think, how you distribute um, the burden, doesn't it? Um, it's, it's, it? It's important that you have uh, an equitable transition where it's not about uh, the, the, the poorest paying the most, but those who, those who consume the most energy. So you can look, for instance, at the treatment of, 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 of private jets, for, for, for instance, or, or high-frequency flyers, people who tend to earn much more than uh, the average. Of course, energy in this country is already very expensive. It's perhaps one of the biggest reasons why we've seen a lot of industry perhaps go offshore. You look at the countries around the world that are doing the best economically, uh, you look at the boom in the United States, largely due to very cheap energy in the United States. I, I, I just wonder, is the technology going to be there? And frankly, is the willingness of local communities going to be there too mm. to deliver this enormous shift? If we're to believe the Labour Party is going to win a lot of rural seats at the next election, they're going to run into some of the same problems that the Conservatives have found over the last 10 years in terms of getting this stuff built and transmitted. Yes, I mean, there are two things, aren't there? There's the uh, NIMBY opposition to uh, new energy developments and, 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 and new housing, obviously, as well. And I think Labour have a window of opportunity where if they're as clear as they're currently being in their manifesto in terms of saying we will bulldoze through, through obstacles because we believe it's mm. essential to deliver growth, and if they win uh, a clear majority at, at the election, then they will have a window of opportunity to get radical planning reform through through Parliament. I think it's essential you move early before mm. you lose momentum. George, do you think they need to put what they want to do in their manifesto? Because so far they've only said, we're going to do planning reform. They still haven't said how. Yeah. And, and, and this is the problem Boris Johnson ran into. He said he'd do planning reform, but then when the specifics came, they were defeated, despite his big majority. Could Keir Starmer not suffer the same fate? Yes, I mean you've got to be you've got to be absolutely clear on the on the specifics because, as you say, it's something that British politicians, British leaders have talked about for for much of the last um, decade. I mean, I think it will. I think it's 
it's certainly true that the Conservatives were undermined by having a lot of NIMBYs on their own um, backbenches. I think Keir Starmer will have the authority to impose uh, discipline on Labour, though I'm sure there will be some dissenters. Well, we await to see, maybe. Uh, thank you very much indeed, George Eaton there, Senior Politics Editor at The New Statesman. Yes, yeah, so I just think that when the Labour Party has its plan, for example, for, uh, for, for new energy generation, new pylons, new towns, it's not saying where they'll go before the election. Mm. And if it suddenly wins and then tries to consult on where this stuff goes after the election, they're going to find exactly the same problems. Every single MP, every single Labour MP will say, yes, we support this, just not in my constituency. Yes, well, you can and, say and all sorts of things problems. before you're elected, uh, can't you? And then uh, it remains to be seen what will actually be done. But um, coming up, we're going to be speaking to the MSP, the Member of Scottish Parliament, at the centre of a free speech storm. You won't believe what's going on here. Good afternoon. The top stories from the GB newsroom. The Prime Minister says the UK is taking measures to protect itself from the epoch-defining challenge of an increasingly assertive China, he says. It's after recent cyber attacks which saw hackers access millions of voters' personal details and target MPs and peers who've been critical of Beijing. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden is due to address Parliament later over the threats, with the Prime Minister insisting the government will stop at nothing to protect the British public. A £200 million package of investment aimed at securing the future of the country's nuclear industry has been unveiled. Rishi Sunak has declared a critical national endeavour as he vows to strengthen the nuclear industry and boost jobs. He's introduced a new fund backed by £20 million in public money to support growth in Barrow and Furness. That's the home of Britain's submarine programmes. A review led by independent government adviser Dame Sara Khan has been published, pointing to chilling levels of harassment posing a serious threat to schools. It found more than 75% of the public feel they can't speak their mind and 27% have employed security or moved jobs or house as a result. As part of her review, Dame Sara is recommending the establishment of an exclusion zone for protests outside of schools. She told GB News victims need more support from police. Many victims, again, they told me repeatedly, was that the police are saying this hasn't crossed any criminal threshold. It might be because some of this behaviour is taking place on online forums and is not being sent directly to the victim. That doesn't lessen the impact on victims who are seeing this um, uh, behaviour online that's being directed at towards them. So again, this is why I'm saying, as one of my recommendations to the government, is that all 39 police forces in England should have a police officer who specialises in harassment legislation, malicious communications, um, as well, that are able to provide support to victims because they are often overlooked and not necessarily even seen as victims. And some breaking news just in. The Boeing CEO and other senior executives are to step down from the aircraft manufacturer amid a management shake-up. That, of course, following a major incident on board a Boeing 737 MAX plane when a panel blew out from the aircraft mid-air in January. We'll bring you more on this story as we get it. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. New rules are going to give staff at NHS England paid leave if they suffer a miscarriage. Yeah, any of the NHS England staff who miscarry in the first 24 weeks of pregnancy will be able to take 10 days paid leave. Their partners can take five. Well, we're lucky enough right now to be able to speak exclusively to the founder of George's Law and national baby loss campaigner, Keely Lengthorn. A very good morning to you, Keely. First of all, um, it's called George's Law because it is a, a major step forward and that's one of your son's names, isn't it? Yes, it is, and yes, um, I lost my son, unfortunately, George, um, two years ago. Um, he was still born at, at 23 weeks. Um, I was flabbergasted after having George to know that I was required by law to return straight back to work the next day. So under current legislation in the UK, if you give birth to a baby under 24 weeks, the law says you should be going back to work the next day. 
So for instance, I left George at the mortuary on a Thursday evening, had a midwife coming to stop my milk on a Friday, but the law says I should be in work the next day. Such an archaic way of, of working now, and I don't know why we are not following the New Zealand model and changing law and allowing employees three days paid leave. So under legislation in New Zealand, all employees get three days paid leave in the event of a miscarriage under 24 weeks. And it, it is... It is so um, brilliant to see the NHS sort of taking a stance. They're the UK's biggest employer, 1.7 million employees. And they're, let's face it, they're on their knees in terms of financial hardship. But if, if, the, if the NHS can do this, I don't know why others can't. Yeah, and um, you make the interesting point as well that uh, although it is now there for NHS workers, they may have to face sending home bereaved parents who haven't got that right. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 37 minutes past 12, and a number of you have been getting, touch, uh, getting in touch about the interview we had at the top of the programme with Dame Sara Khan, the anti-extremism advisor for the government. Anthony says, well done, Dame Sara. At last, someone who tells it like it is. Yes, there seems to be resounding support for what she had to say. She was very straightforward and accurate mm. with what she was saying, I must say. Mary says, well done to Dame Sara. The government needs to deal with this issue. It's frightening and local councils don't seem to care. Is it any wonder we can't get teachers into the profession. And Steve agrees with one of her specific proposals. Angry protesters should not be allowed anywhere near schools or our children. That sounds a lot like common sense, Steve. Thank you very much. Keep your views coming in. We'll get to some more in a little bit. But first... Yes, a member of the Scottish Parliament has threatened to take legal action against Police Scotland after a tweet he posted criticising the Scottish Government's transgender policy was logged as a hate incident. Yes, veteran Conservative Murdo Fraser said the force had behaved not just outrageously but unlawfully. There's his tweet. Choosing to identify as non-binary is as valid as choosing to identify as a cat. I'm not sure government should be spending time on action plans for either. That's Murdo's uh, tweet. Um, but yes, he says the force has behaved outrageously and unlawfully. And indeed, he says that it should be legal to express a political view not to be logged as a hate incident. But let's join uh, the Conservative MSP for Mid Scotland and Fife, Murdo Fraser, right now. Murdo, thank you for making the time for us this afternoon. Um, when did you first learn that your tweets had been logged as a hate incident? Well, first of all, good afternoon and, and thanks for, for having me on. Um, what was really concerning about this incident is I had no knowledge at all that uh, this had been logged as a hate incident. What happened was the complainer in this case, who turns out to be a trans rights activist, complained to the police. The police logged it as a hate incident, it didn't tell me. It was only when the complainer then went to make a complaint to the Ethical Standards Commissioner, who is the individual who polices the conduct of uh, parliamentarians, to allege I had broken uh, the code of conduct that applies to members of parliament. Uh, the, 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 the commissioner dismissed that complaint, not surprisingly, but wrote to me, as he always does when there's a complaint, to inform me of it. And that was when I became aware. That was back in December of last year. At that point, I wrote to the chief constable of Police Scotland to express my very serious concerns about what had happened. I still have not had the courtesy of a response from her. But two weeks ago, I received a reply from my local a police commander in Perth, where I live, 
saying that a hate incident had indeed been recorded. And, you know, this raises all sorts of serious issues around freedom of speech, because my tweet was not, a, was not directed at any individual. It was a criticism of Scottish government policy on gender issues. And, you know, are we really in a place where opposition politicians criticising government policy are now treated as being guilty of hate incidents? That's no, not where we should be in a liberal democracy. Are the police following the law here? Must they log these types of claims as hate incidents? No, there is no law that underpins this. Now, the new Scottish Hate Crime Act will come into play on the 1st of April, a week, <laughs> a week from today. But even under that new act, there is no requirement on Police Scotland to log what they call non-crime hate incidents. This is simply a matter of policy by the police. Now, the police in England and Wales had a very similar policy that they tore up last year mm. following public concern and following a number of court cases uh, where it was clear that establishing a, a hate incident purely on the basis of the attitude of the complainer, which is what Police Scotland do, was, was deemed to be inappropriate and possibly unlawful in England. So the police in England and Wales have torn this up. Police Scotland, for reasons best known to themselves, I've continued with this policy. I'm very grateful to the uh, Free Speech Union who have provided uh, legal advice to me, which is compelling and comprehensive, and which states that this policy of Police Scotland is unlawful. But that's one of the problems, isn't, isn't it, Murdo? It's all about perception. So if I said something mean to, or just said something to Tom that he then found offensive, mm. he could get it logged as a hate incident. Yeah. The, the, I mean, the if we were in Scotland. Well, well, this happened to yeah. Theresa May, didn't it? In, in her conference speech when she was Home Secretary, someone reported it and it was logged. Uh, I suppose England has, has updated, but Scotland hasn't. Murdo, you mentioned that this hate speech legislation, separate from this incident, is, is, is coming uh, into force in Scotland on the 1st of April. Now, that's... Um, of course, April Fool's Day, which hasn't uh, as escaped the notice of, of many commentators. But what will fundamentally change with regard to that legislation in terms of people's rights north of the border? Well, the difference will be that at the moment it is an offence to be guilty of what's classed as stirring up hatred. But that only applies in relation to one protected characteristic, which is race. Uh, the... the uh, the, the, the offence of stirring up hatred will apply to all protected characteristics. That will be uh, sex, gender, transgender identity, disability, uh, religion, uh, uh, and so on. So, so potentially that opens the door to a whole range of new offences. But even more concerning, because the, the, the police in Scotland are running a publicity campaign encouraging people to come forward and make complaints, my concern is the police are going to be deluged with spurious and vexatious complaints. I remember uh, Humza Yusuf. I remember the there was eye. there was quite a lot of hoo ha, wasn't there, over Humza Yusuf potentially criminalising what you say around your own dinner table at home, and the sort yeah. of scenario of your grandma being taken away in handcuffs because she said something a bit backward. Well, well, that's right. Of course, you know, anybody can make a complaint in any environment. It could be a private conversation. Somebody could complain about something that was said privately, and and uh, under the. The Police Scotland policy as it stands, even if it doesn't meet the standard of criminality, mm. they will record it as a hate incident. So potentially we could see thousands of hate incidents being recorded every single day. Now, Police Scotland have just said in, within the last month they don't have the resources to investigate minor crimes. So, you know, we could have people reporting burglaries, uh, reporting vandalism, uh, which are not being investigated by the police because they don't have the resources. At the same time, as they have said, they will investigate every single incident of a hate crime that is reported. So you can see the police being completely overwhelmed with spurious accusations against people in the public eye. People, for example, like uh, J.K. Rowling, who's quite outspoken on social media on gender issues, mm -hmm. uh, and not having the time and resources to investigate real crimes that actually affect people. But, Murdo, as you say, this is going to apply to all protected characteristics. This isn't just going to be about um, gender or race or sexuality, but also philosophy. There was a court case recently that found that veganism oh, yeah. is a protected characteristic. Oh, if I make a joke about vegans being weedy, am I going to be arrested? 
Well, you might not be arrested, but at the very least, you'd have a hate incident recorded against you. Now, who knows what that, you know, what, what, what we're still not doing, what the consequences of that are. If I do a, if I do a, 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 an application to the police, for example, say I need an enhanced disclosure check, does that show up? that I've had a hate incident recorded against me? If I apply for a firearms license, does that mean that shows up against me? This is what we're not clear about. But it is clear from the advice we've taken, Police Scotland are acting unlawfully, mm. and I'm determined to see this policy torn up. Well, thank you very much indeed for your time. Murdo Fraser, Conservative MSP for Mid-Scotland and Fife. Great to speak to you. I guess some people say, oh, well, you shouldn't say anything nasty on the internet. But, but that's entirely subjective. I know. And, and as, as you rightly said, if it only relies on what the person who has been in receipt of the comment has felt, there's no, there's no recourse there. It's just, I think something's nasty, therefore it's going to be logged on your police so if record. you said all women should be chained to the kitchen sink and do the ironing, could I then say, oh, that's a... A misogynistic, and that's a hate crime. Well, that would be misogynistic. Get you down in a hate incident. <laughs> yeah, but if it was a joke. You see, oh, this is where yeah, it's yeah, difficult, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Anyway, a police spokesman has said, on Monday, November the 20th, 2023, officers received a report of an offensive tweet. Gosh. Inquiries were carried out and no criminality was established. The incident was recorded as a non-crime hate incident. Hate incidents are not recorded against alleged perpetrators. The Scottish Government said that there are protections in the new Act for individuals' rights in respect to freedom of expression for the new stirring up hatred offences. Curious, let us know what you make of that all. Non-crime hate incidents. We're getting to sort of Orwellian it is territory Orwellian, here, it? isn't it? It's, it's just very, very pretend. Is, is, is this a thought crime or a non-crime hate What do you do when incidents? you can't solve real crime? You solve non-crimes. Coming up, <laughs> shocking new figures show migrants who've been fighting deportation from the UK received more than £70 million in legal aid in just five years. Well, much more on that after this short break. Welcome along to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. More wet weather to come throughout this week, really. Not too much today across parts of East Anglia and the southeast, but it is a pretty chilly start to the working week. Low pressure sitting just to the west of the UK, as it will be for the next several days. Weather fronts pushing northwards. Far northwest of Scotland, seeing some bright or even sunny spells. And as I mentioned, much of East Anglia and the southeast dry. But everywhere, it's drab, it's damp. And it's fairly breezy as well. Some heavy bursts of rain across the southwest and the wet weather turning to snow over the hills across eastern Scotland. Temperatures here really struggling, six, seven degrees at best. Further south, we might get to double digits, maybe 11 or 12 with a bit of brightness in the southeast, but still fairly chilly for the time of year. And it's going to be really cold rain in eastern Scotland this evening. We'll see more snow over the hills. That could cause some problems on the highest routes, the A9, for example, seeing some heavy snow for a time through the night. Elsewhere, the rain will tend to ease across a good chunk of England and Wales. Temperatures will fall down to single figures. Uh, but generally, a dry start for many on Tuesday. Still pretty cloudy, and there is more rain to come, more snow to come for eastern Scotland, with chiefly rain at lower levels. But this Zone of wet weather then works back across parts of the Midlands into Wales and across southeast England. So a much wetter day here. Something a bit brighter for South Wales and southwest England, but still, although we may get to double digits, most of us on the chilly side. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. 
with my panel here on Jubes & Co. We debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It is 10 to 1. And migrants who've been fighting deportation from the United Kingdom received more than £70 million in legal aid over just five years. Yes, new figures show that legal costs totaled £71 million between 2019 and 2023. That's about £38,000 a day. Well, a huge asylum backlog puts further pressure on the government, with hundreds of illegal immigrants arriving every single week. Channel crossings have grown by about 10% to this time compared with last year, although last year was lower than the year before, mm -hmm. but the figure has already exceeded 4,000 this year. Well, let's speak to human rights lawyer David Haig. Uh, David, thank you very much for joining us. Great to speak to you again. Um, lots of people will look at this figure and be quite shocked. £71 million spent on essentially fighting deportations. Uh, good afternoon to you both. I mean, I'd, I'd like to say I was surprised, but I'm, I'm, I'm surprised it's not higher. I mean, one of the things that's certainly going to happen when the Rwanda bill becomes, becomes law, which, which it will do soon, is that this figure is going to significantly increase. Um, but I'm, I'm not surprised at, at the figure that we're discussing today, because asylum seekers on their appeals are entitled to uh, legal aid. And so you think that this bill will increase because it'll be more complicated legal work to challenge uh, Rwanda deportations or, 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 or that people will be more uh, just lodging more, more complaints in, in general, lodging more appeals? I think one of the things that you're going to see is that when, the, when, when it becomes legislation, you're going to see an, a lot of legal actions on not just the asylum, the technical individual asylum cases, but the, the larger principle on whether it's in contravention with our laws and then the international laws that we have. And I think that majority of that will probably be legal aided. And that means the figure is going to go up and up. Now, Robert Jenrick and Suella Braverman raised this, just two politicians who raised the issue of the appeals process, saying that Rwanda bill isn't strong enough to stop the uh, merry-go-round of legal appeals, I think is what they called it. Um, so, and you clearly agree, then, that this bill Absolutely. is not strong I mean, enough to prevent, you know, tons of appeals being, being launched. Absolutely, I think that's what you that, that you know I said before that that's what what you what, what's going to happen in terms of legal fee, in in terms of legal work because you're going to see an awful lot more I think not you know a lot more challenges with this legally from the larger side but also individual cases as well until there is clear precedent as to whether or not once this legislation is is is, is on the books whether or not um, it can be challenged and if so how and that that is coming that's something that's you know a few weeks away that we're going to we, we're going to very much see mm. um, uh, and and the, so. The, the, the money's the, the the cost of the taxpayer, I'm afraid, is is, is definitely going to go up. And David, you say that a large majority of this will be legal aided. What's the difference between uh, the sort of claims that can receive legal aid versus those that can't? Can any illegal migrant who's just arrived in the UK claim legal aid? I think that what you need to, I mean, effectively, once that, so, so for instance, if the Foreign Office basically declines their applications, and the answer to Tom is essentially yes. Um, and, you know, legal aid has always been a controversial area because the legal aid is, is available to a lot of people, which, you know, many understandably would think should not mm. be getting that. We remember the Nate case perhaps of Shamaya Begum, obviously not a, an asylum case, but when other people, perhaps, you know, hardworking British taxpayers can't get legal aid. So legal aid in, in, in general needs to have a, a review. It's long outdated for review, but this is one of the areas where we see um, the real problems in legal aid, because people that a lot of people expecting shouldn't be getting it are, and people that should don't. And But one thing is for certain, the bill is going to go up. Wow. wow. And what if there's a case for sort of limiting the amount of legal aid one person can have or the amount of appeals they can launch and get legal aid but, for that? They uh... can fund it themselves after a certain amount of time. But thank you very much, human rights lawyer David Hay. On that cheery note. On that cheery note. <laughs> <laughs> well, coming up, much more reaction to our interview with Dame Sarah Khan. Now, she's the counter-extremism independent advisor who says that Britain is struggling to cope with our extremism problem. We've got so much more reaction to this and, indeed, her recommendations. What can change? Brighter Outlook with Bob Solar. 
with sponsors of weather on GB News. Welcome along to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. More wet weather to come throughout this week, really. Not too much today across parts of East Anglia and the southeast, but it is a pretty chilly start to the working week. Low pressure sitting just to the west of the UK, as it will be for the next several days. Weather fronts pushing northwards. Far northwest of Scotland, seeing some bright or even sunny spells. And as I mentioned, much of East Anglia and the southeast dry. But everywhere, it's drab, it's damp. And it's fairly breezy as well. Some heavy bursts of rain across the southwest and the wet weather turning to snow over the hills across eastern Scotland. Temperatures here really struggling, six, seven degrees at best. Further south, we might get to double digits, maybe 11 or 12 with a bit of brightness in the southeast, but still fairly chilly for the time of year. And it's going to be really cold rain in eastern Scotland this evening. We'll see more snow over the hills. That could cause some problems on the highest routes, the A9, for example, seeing some heavy snow for a time through the night. Elsewhere, the rain will tend to ease across a good chunk of England and Wales. Temperatures will fall down to single figures, uh, but generally a dry start for many on Tuesday. Still pretty cloudy and there is more rain to come, more snow to come for eastern Scotland with chiefly rain at lower levels, but this zone of wet weather then works back across parts of the Midlands into Wales and across southeast England. So a much wetter day here. Something a bit brighter for South Wales and southwest England, but still, although we may get to double digits, most of us on the chilly side. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. It's the final week to see how you could win big. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash that you could spend however you like. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's one o'clock on Monday, the 25th of March. 
China is accused of a cyber attack on UK electoral records and hacking the data of millions of British voters. We have Rishi Sunak's warning over China's growing cyber threat. And the shocking legal aid costs of our migration crisis. It's been revealed that more than £70 million over five years has been paid for migrants fighting deportation from the UK. The UK's top universities are now getting most of their fees from foreign students. Is this undermining the prospects of British applicants or subsidising them? We'll be debating if we should introduce a cap on the number of overseas people studying here. And live pictures here of New York where the clock is ticking for Donald Trump to stump up almost $500 million for legal costs. His property could be seized if he does not stump up that cash. We'll keep you updated on the latest developments. Now, this hour, we're debating international students. 600,000 of them came to the United Kingdom last year, but some fear it's squeezing out British students from British universities. There's another side to the argument, though, which is they pay a lot more than the Brits. Could it be that they actually enable more places for British students to go to university. Yes, we're talking about this because The Times has revealed today that a lot of our universities are essentially totally financially reliant on foreign students. And, of course, they did report not too long ago about how, actually, for some foreign students, they're able to get onto degree courses with far lower results than their British counterparts. Mm. Is that fair? Do we need foreign students? Perhaps do we have too many universities that are reliant on foreign students, some of them not, you know, of the highest calibre, let's say, to be diplomatic? Only because you went to a good one. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? What's going on here? Well, the problem is people are sold a lie, aren't they, some people, mm. when they go to there university? There are too many people going to university, frankly. Is, is, is it just... Are we over academizing uh, all of our all of our work. But the, the question of... is, should we have a cap on foreign students in British universities or would that be self-sabotage? Let us know. Mm. GBviews at gbnews.com. Well, we'll be debating that and indeed much more after your headlines with Tatiana. Tom, thank you. The top stories this hour. The Prime Minister says the UK is taking measures to protect itself from the epoch-defining challenge of an increasingly assertive China. It's after recent cyber attacks which saw hackers access millions of voters' personal details and target MPs and peers who've been critical of Beijing. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden is due to address Parliament today over the threats, with the Prime Minister insisting the government will stop at nothing to protect the British public. We've been very clear that the situation now is that China is behaving in an increasingly uh, assertive way abroad, authoritarian at home, and it represents an epoch-defining challenge uh, and also the greatest state-based threat to our economic security. So it's right that we take measures to protect ourselves, which is what we are doing. To give some specific examples, we've used our new national security investment powers to block investment from China into sensitive technology sectors like semiconductors, our National Security Act and others means that we can take any other steps that we need to. A £200 million package of investment aimed at securing the future of the country's nuclear industry has been unveiled. Rishi Sunak has declared a critical national endeavour as he vows to strengthen the nuclear industry and boost jobs. He's introduced a new fund backed by £20 million in public money to support growth in Barrow Inverness, that's the home of Britain's submarine programmes, and a further £180 million a year over the next decade, which Downing Street says will provide grants to local organisations. Energy Security Minister Andrew Bowie says it's a bonus for job creation in parts of the country where they're desperately needed. The huge benefits of, of all of this investment in new technologies, including nuclear, is that we're going to be creating uh, hundreds of thousands of new high-wage, high-skill jobs, the length and breadth of the country, many in places where high-wage jobs uh, are actually at a premium. And that's why I'm so excited about the investment that we are making today uh, in Sizewell C and Hinkley Point C and a third gigawatt-scale project coming down the line after that and our small modular reactor program. This is going to create a whole new uh, range of energy technologies to support our transition to to uh, become more energy secure and independent. 
Breaking news this hour, the Crown Prosecution Service has been cleared of wrongdoing in accepting the plea of triple killer Valdo Calacane without going to trial, a report states. Grace Amali Kuma and Barnaby Weber, along with school caretaker Ian Coates, were all killed in June last year in a spate of knife attacks whilst Calacane was suffering from schizophrenia. He was sentenced to a hospital order instead of being sent to prison. His Majesty's Crown Prosecution Inspectorate said the correct decision was made in accepting pleas of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. A review led by independent government adviser Dame Sara Khan has been published, pointing to chilling levels of harassment posing a serious threat to schools. It found more than 75% of the public feel they can't speak their mind and 27% have employed security or moved jobs or houses as a result. As part of her review, Dame Sara is recommending the establishment of an exclusion zone for protests outside of schools. She told GB News victims need more support from police. Many victims, again, they told me repeatedly, was that the police are saying this hasn't crossed any criminal threshold. It might be because some of this behaviour is taking place on online forums and is not being sent directly to the victim. That doesn't lessen the impact on victims who are seeing this um, uh, behaviour online that's being directed at towards them. So, again, this is why I'm saying, as one of my recommendations to the government, is that all 39 police forces in England should have a police officer who specialises in harassment legislation, malicious communications... Um, as well, that are able to provide support to victims because they are often overlooked and not necessarily even seen as victims. Two men have been found guilty of murdering a footballer stabbed to death on the dance floor of a nightclub on Boxing Day. 23-year-old Cody Fisher was killed shortly before midnight by a masked group at the Crane Club in Birmingham in 2022. He died at the scene. 23-year-old Remy Gordon and 22-year-old Cami Carpenter were convicted today. A third defendant, 19-year-old Regan Anderson, was found not guilty of murder. Boeing has announced a major management shake-up in the wake of safety concerns. The CEO and other senior executives are to step down from the aircraft manufacturer by the end of this year. The company have been under pressure following an incident where a panel blew out at 16,000 feet on an Alaska Airlines Boeing 737 MAX in January. The Home Office is launching social media adverts to deter Vietnamese nationals from travelling to the UK illegally on small boats. The government says an increasing number of migrants coming via the channel are from Vietnam. New ads, building on similar ones already used in Albania, will be written in Vietnamese and set out risks of being exploited by smuggling gangs who profit from facilitating small boat crossings. Energy regulator Ofgem says it's to consider a new dynamic price cap based on the time of day households use their energy. It's launched a consultation on a range of options for the future of the price cap, including a more dynamic cap to encourage consumer flexibility. Other options include a, include a targeted cap, which could be based on vulnerability or capping the margin suppliers can make. And some more breaking news into us just now. Shamima Begum has lost an initial bid to challenge the removal of her British citizenship at the Supreme Court. It comes a month after the Court of Appeal dismissed her challenge over the removal of her citizenship. We'll bring you more on this story as we get it. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now back to Tom and Emily. Thank you, Tatiana. And my goodness, that breaking news. How many more appeals does Shamima Begum have to lose until she gets the message? Yes, when I saw that, I thought, oh, wasn't it only a couple of weeks ago that we were reporting that she'd uh, lost another appeal? But there you go, this lost one at the is at the Court of Supreme Appeal, Court. now lost at the Supreme Court. There's not much further she can go, really. I'm sure the lawyers will persist. They did say at the time they will do everything that they can, yeah, did they not? Um, but anyway, in other news, Britain is officially pointing the finger at China for a cyber attack in 2021 that accessed the personal details of 40 million British voters, an accusation that Beijing says is baseless and also a smear. 
Well, the government is set to slap the key players in the cyber attack with hefty new sanctions. The Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, will warn that several high-profile politicians have also been the target of Chinese hackers. Well, let's discuss this further with GB News Home and Security Editor Mark White. Um, Mark, thank you very much. Um, what do we know about this threat and what are we expecting the Deputy Prime Minister to tell us later? Well, we know that uh, China has become increasingly assertive in what it is doing in the cybersphere to uh, target uh, the UK and, uh, of course, individuals within the UK as well as organisations. Now, what we are expecting to hear from the Deputy Prime Minister today when he speaks to the House of Commons around about 3.30 this afternoon will be confirmation that the government believes that Beijing was behind a massive attack on the Electoral Commission in 2021. It was only really discovered in 2021. 2022. But that attack led to uh, the details, personal details, of some 40 million individuals, effectively the electorate in the UK being compromised, uh, personal details being out there. But in addition to that attack on the Electoral Commission, uh, there are also uh, targeting of 43 other individuals, including we're told parliamentarians. Now, some of those parliamentarians are being briefed today on what the authorities know about just what uh, Beijing was up to. But clearly, it is an escalation. There is real concern. It's not just China. We know that Russia, uh, North Korea, Iran uh, all have active uh, um, programs that are all about spreading disinformation um, and trying to disrupt the democratic process in the UK and other Western countries. Uh, but China today will be called out specifically. We heard a little earlier from the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, who said that this was a significant challenge that the UK is facing. Now, We've been very clear that the situation now is that China is behaving in an increasingly uh, assertive way abroad, authoritarian at home, and it represents an epoch-defining challenge uh, and also the greatest state-based threat to our economic security. So it's right that we take measures to protect ourselves, which is what we are doing. Now, Mark... Within this today, we're going to hear that certain high-profile members of parliament have been targeted by China. What sort of thing does that actually mean? How sophisticated is the Chinese spying network within the UK? Well, it ranges uh, in sophistication from the very um, basic level of just kind of uh, information gathering, profile gathering uh, on individuals, uh, which is going on at, at basically uh, a very significant level in terms of the number of people involved. But then there are certain individuals, we believe, that are singled out by Beijing for more uh, in in, in terms of exactly uh, what they want to do in gathering more information. We remember last September uh, the news when there was an arrest uh, of a parliamentary researcher uh, who was linked to some senior Conservative MPs uh, in the parliamentary estate. Uh, so some real concern about just what Beijing is doing mm. uh, with a view to not just gathering information, but potentially disrupting the democratic process. Now, we have uh, the Defending Democracy Task Force that was set up recently. Also last year, of course, the National Security Act was passed, and this gives uh, the likes of government, uh, the security services, law enforcement, more tools at their disposal to try to safeguard our infrastructure in the cybersphere and also give us more uh, of an ability not just to counter but to potentially hit back at those who seek to damage us. Thank you very much indeed. Mark White, our Home and Security Editor. Please bring us any uh, developments on that story. Thank you very much. Any yes.
Well, Labour's plans to make the UK's electricity grid carbon zero as soon as 2030, well, that's expected to cost an extra £116 billion of taxpayers' money, according to new analysis. Yes, this comes as the Conservatives have already committed to a net zero power system by 2035, so Labour want it five years sooner. Joining us now is Angela Knight, former Chief Executive of Energy UK and the former Economic Secretary to the Treasury. Angela, great to speak to you. £116 billion, pounds. it sounds an awful lot of money uh, to be spent. Who is most likely to bear that cost? Well, we're going to bear it. £116 billion pounds. sounds a lot of money. It is a lot of money. And the only place that it can come from is the taxpayers and the consumers of, of energy. And broadly speaking, that's both the same. So it comes from us. I think, though, if I may say that to try and bring the target forward from uh, 2035 to 2030, has a, it's faintly ridiculous, actually. There is no way that it can be done that quickly. We haven't got the supply chains, the, com the, the hugely significant projects that would have to be completed in whatever, five, six years' time, simply cannot be completed by then. Uh, I appreciate Labour's talked about offshore wind and particularly what they call floating uh, wind today. But the reality is there's the grid to do. They, we need the backup, which is a mixture of gas and new gas fired power stations, which can be brought in quickly, you know, when the wind stops blowing. Uh, and also baseload, new nuclear. It's just an impossibility. In fact, I personally think 2035 is uh, pretty heroic. And what well, that's seems very to interesting. So, yeah, uh, what seems to me the case is people are sort of vying for how quickly they can do yeah. something rather than look at the practicalities, the supply chains, the engineers, the cost, and so on. And that's really where the debate should lie. Uh, Angela, there are 69 million people in the United Kingdom, men, women, children, babies. <laughs> this would cost around £2,000 per individual. Now, per family, that might be four times, five times that amount. Mm. This is a huge amount of money. It is. I mean, some of it, to be clear, because it's capital cost, will come from the private sector. It won't all come from the public sector. So, you know, we just sort of need to think about it like that. Mm. But it's still got to be paid for. And it'll be paid for on our energy bills, certainly, in part. And there's another aspect of it, which I also think is... Uh, inappropriate language and that is the phraseology which talks about security and particularly the phraseology that this is cheap energy it isn't cheap energy yes wind might be now a cheaper way of building you know a quantum of power but you've got to have the backup so mm -hmm. for every so every piece of, of of wind turbine that we build we've also got to have another piece mm -hmm. of gas or nuclear so therefore your costs are in fact twice rather than less. Oh, so nice. there's an aspect there which I think is very important to consider and is omitted from the state the statements. And I think that that is a very great pity because to a great extent, the well, I should say not to a great extent, they're almost completely absent from the whole of the energy discuss discussion is who pays how much and for what. And That's we the absolutely need to get there. That's a brilliant point. Sadly, we're going to have to leave it there, but really great to talk to you. Angela Knight, former Chief Executive of Energy UK, and she's also the former Economic Secretary to the Treasury. I think that's such a good point that she makes there mm. um, to finish. It, it, does, it does seem that in order for this to work, and let's all hope it does work at some point, perhaps not by 2030, we're going to need some huge breakthrough in battery technology. Mm. You're going to need to be able to store the, the wind energy or the sun energy somehow in a better way rather than running two power stations at the same time just for, but, for backup. But also politicians like to always say, oh, renewables are cheaper. But as Angela clarified there, they also require backup because they are intermittent mm. and that's where the costs yeah. start to grow need, and mount. better storage or backup. Yeah. So, so that breakthrough in battery technology. Elon Musk, please, get off Twitter. Start, start inventing If only all things. our politicians had that clarity <laughs> of speaking, eh? Yeah, well, uh, uh, coming up, Britain's top universities now get most of their fees from foreign students, making up nearly 60% of those funds. Should universities put a cap on foreign students? We'll be debating that very shortly.
Free Speech Nation. Sunday nights from 7 p.m. I've got an idea. I think that all 30-year-olds should be given £10,000 from the banks of baby boomers. We've got a situation in this country now where millennials are the first generation in modern times expecting to be poorer than their parents. We, as 30-year-olds like me, are half as likely to own a house as people my age 30 years ago. In fact, the cost of a home in Britain compared to average incomes has as big a gap today as it did, wait for it, in the 1860s. It is a Dickensian situation. Now, I'm sorry about the housing crisis for your generation. You're not, though, are you? No, because you're I profiting am. from it. I'm profiting from it. Don't of course be ridiculous. You are. The house prices now, right. compared to that period. If this is the case, have, Benjamin. Have incomes gone up that fast? To, to penalise and punish the elderly when they have worked yeah. all their lives to put into the system and say it's your fault, whingy whiny, we're going to yeah, be envious of No, Linda, go, we're no, being punished. No, well, by the politics, so be we're the being change punished you want to see in the taxes, world. Taxes, be the change. I am actually, and I'm about to tell you about the change I want to see in the world. Are you good? As long as you're whining about it. I'm going to stop whining about it, but the re we are being taken advantage of at the moment to profit, to help the old. Mo most of taxpayers' money is spent in two departments, the NHS, so the health department, and the Department for Work and Pensions. Those departments disproportionately serve the older population. Now, I've got no issue with that, but let's not pretend, let's not pretend that it is not young working people that is paying for the public services for old people. So actually, we are having it hard, and I just look at the future, and we see a future of perpetually higher taxes to pay for this increasing ageing population, a shrinking labour force, and you're here saying so we've got nothing to worry vote. about. change how you vote. The young stop voting for mass immigration. Immigration parties, the young, I haven't. stop voting for Immigr parties Sorry, just to, that just to don't point out, build houses. Immigrants actually pay taxes, pensioners don't. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 22 minutes past one. But let's return to those shocking figures that migrants who have been fighting deportation from the UK have been funded by the UK. More than £70 million in legal aid in just five years. Yes, new figures show that legal costs totaled £71 million between 2019 and 2023. That's about £38,000 a day. Well, joining us now is James Crouch, Associate Director at Opinium Research. Uh, and James... I'm, I'm going to hazard a guess here. The British public probably aren't that keen on spending this amount of money on legal aid for people fighting deportation. <laughs> uh, probably not. Good afternoon, Tom and Emily. Um, so the, the, the basic thing that matters in the politics here is that the British public broadly want immigration lower and have been pretty unhappy with how the government has handled it over the past few years. Um, now, there are an awful lot of problems in there. Um, that the government's not really been very good at being honest with the public about or being able to communicate very well with the public on. But, yeah, you, you can imagine that the, the headlines around legal costs are just going to add to their woes. Well, quite. So where do we stand with immigration? Because following Brexit, I understand that opinion, the salience of immigration as a topic for the general public went down. My view is that was probably because they thought Brexit would lead to more control over immigration, so it wasn't such a stark issue. But it seems to be creeping up and up in, in voter priorities. Is that right? Uh, very much so. So, yeah, you're right to say that when Boris Johnson was Prime Minister and the focus was on Brexit, um, only around a fifth of people put immigration as, you know, kind of a key issue 
um, for, for the UK. That's now, it's creeping up to almost 40% now. So it's a lot higher. Um, and that's been kind of going up and up and up during Rishi Sunak's time in office. Um, now, the, the challenges for the government here, um, because it's put a strain on the Conservative Party rather than proving to be an opportunity for them. The, the strain it's put on them is, I guess, one, the, the main, uh, the largest numbers coming are actually legal migration. So ultimately, they're the result of the government's own immigration policy. What do they have to say about that? Um, and then the, the second thing is they've communicated mainly around illegal migration. So things like small boats uh, and, and, and the channel. And the problem is there that, once again, they have a flagship policy they have not been able to implement. So you're left with a scenario where the public want lower migration, think that the Conservative Party probably agrees with them, more than anyone else at least, that have very, very little trust that they will actually get anything done. Yeah, it's that sense that the politicians keep saying things that then don't happen. James Crouch, thank you very much for joining us uh, of Opinion Research. Yes, they talk about it all the time and then they don't, uh, <laughs> yeah. don't solve the problem. Not a great recipe for electoral success, perhaps. But a related issue now. Britain's most prestigious universities are getting most of their fees from foreign students. At some of the Russell Group universities, reports suggest that as much as 57% of income generated from fees is coming from foreign students. But universities are insisting that the ability to attract rising numbers from overseas is a sign of success. And they say have, they have little choice but to rely on foreign students given a near decade-long freeze in domestic fees. So fees that Brits pay, mm. they've been frozen for a little while now. And isn't that the point? Many people argue that actually having more foreign students keeps those fees low because foreign students pay so much more and therefore you can subsidise British students with their fees. Yes, yes, but we're going to be debating whether there should be a cap on foreign students at British universities because there have been reports of people abusing the system. Yes. There have also been reports of people coming from abroad, starting a degree course, um, working within the economy, and then uh, not completing their course. Mm. So uh, dropout rates at some of our universities are extremely mm. high for foreign students. And then there's the question of whether British universities should be prioritising British candidates. We also saw reports uh, recently about how uh, some foreign students are being allowed on courses with lower grades than their British counterparts. Can that be fair? And the other aspect of this, of course, is where do people go? We don't build very much student accommodation in the United Kingdom. There are reports of some students at York University having to live in Hull and commuting in. And so if there are more and more students coming, yes, you keep the fees lower. But my goodness, where do they go? Right, well, let's have the debate. Joining us now is Vice-Chancellor at the University of Buckingham, Professor James Tooley, who thinks there should not be a cap. And we have the author and broadcaster, Christine Hamilton, who thinks there should be a cap on foreign students. Well, there you go. Two sides of the debate there. <laughs> yes, Christine, why don't you start? You're wanting the change. Why? I'm not saying that there should necessarily be a particular numerical cap, but the whole system has somehow got to change. It's got completely out of kilter, and the native students are being pushed out by foreign students for understandable financial reasons, because the universities can't... Um, they can't cover their costs just with native students because the tuition fees have been uh, stagnant for so long. It's... And the... And the uh, foreign students, in particular the Chinese students, it's the one British product that the Chinese badly want to buy and they will pay for it because the British education is the best in the world. Of course it is, no wonder everybody wants it. But we've got to get the balance changed. We've got to make sure that more of our own students are able to go. Personally, I think we should have fewer universities and we should concentrate our financial firepower on fewer universities and better universities. We need to scrap degrees like mm. football culture. I mean, you know, David Beckham studies, for heaven's sake. And you can even do a degree in flower arranging. I mean, they call it floral design or something like that, but flower <laughs> arranging. That sort of thing really has to go. And let's concentrate, as I say, our financial firepower mm. on quality and make sure that that quality is available to our British students. Well, There's let's throw this over to Professor James Tooley, who I understand is not a professor of flower arranging, <laughs> um, but is instead uh, 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 in education, I believe. Um, but um, uh, Professor Tooley. 
Yes, I mean, what Christine said is absolutely right. What a tremendous thing it is that so many foreign students want to come here, that we have this global reputation for education excellence, and it's pretty well deserved. Um, and uh, so so, so th that that's great. We also get e economic benefits from the students coming across here, and um, uh, and that helps with the also with the, the gaiety of our nation, where different people from different backgrounds share with each other and um, and enjoy uh, uh, being together and so on. So I think there are those three main reasons why we want to encourage um, uh, foreign students. But I, I would say something does worry me very much about the debate and the way the debate is framed. And you hinted at it as well, Chris. Um, this idea that somehow foreign students should be a cash cow for universities and the universities depend on foreign income from foreign students. Um, you, you mentioned the figure of the Russell Group Universities, 57% foreign student income. That doesn't mean, of course, 43% is home student income, which is nearly half. Um, but did, did you know, for instance, that it was illegal until 1967 for universities to charge differential fees? It was against the Race Relations Act. And various governments have brought it in, including the Margaret Thatcher government in the 1980s, where universities could charge differential fees for foreign and home students, but with the caveat spoken very clearly by Margaret Thatcher saying this was only this was so that the universities were not subsidizing foreign students. Hang on, James, James, are you saying that universities are not using foreign students as a cash cow? I mean, what proportion, no, for example, No, I'm saying this, this worries me. This oh, worries, worries me. Oh, you. Okay, you're saying it is happening. Yeah. It is happening. What proportion of, yeah. just out of interest, what proportion of students at the University of Buckingham are foreign students? And are there cases where foreign students are allowed onto courses with lower grades than British students? Um, so it, it, it varies over the years, but it's roughly 50-50 at my university. And, and the answer to your other question is no. And incidentally, that whole report in the Sunday Times was comparing apples and oranges, if you recall. It was saying stu foreign students admitted onto foundation courses mm. needed gr these grades. Home students admitted onto degree courses needed these. That's not comparing like with like. So it was a slightly uh, disingenuous report. But the point I'm trying to make is that should not be allowed. That should not be permitted where uh, uh, universities are charging mag huge fees to foreign students to subsidize, subsidize research, which the government compels universities to do through the research excellence and, um, uh, and, and home students. If there are higher fees, it should be so that foreign okay. students their full economic costs, as envisaged by Margaret Thatcher um, back in... Uh, James, <laughs> I'll just bring in Christine, because we're running out of time. Um, Christine, a last word on you. Do you worry that if we if we clamp down on foreign students that perhaps we'll lose uh, something in the way of global uh, reach? Well, uh, as I understand it, and obviously all universities are different, and Buckingham, by the way, is a brilliant example of a private university. They get something like a 97% employment rate for their graduates. They are what we should be aiming for. But as I understand it, foreign students actually don't tend to mix. They tend to congregate in their own ethnic groups. So you'll get the Chinese mixing with the Chinese, etc. So you don't get this great big sort of melting pot mm. quite in the way that people might mm. imagine. We've got to rethink the whole thing. It Obviously, the foreign students, they produce something like £30 billion pounds, uh, to the UK economy that's a massive amount of money and if if we cancel them all we have to make it up elsewhere we've got to get the balance right so get well, rid of some mickey mouse degrees and and give our native students a better run for their money christine hamilton professor james tooley thank you very much for joining us both we'll have to leave it there uh, yes coming up donald trump he is now on his way to court for his stormy daniels hush money case. Uh, there we go. We're going to be bringing you all the very latest. Uh, but first, let's quickly get your headlines. Emily, thank you. The top stories this hour. Former ISIS bride Shamima Begum has lost an initial bid to challenge the removal of her British citizenship at the Supreme Court. Last year, Ms Begum lost her first appeal against the decision to revoke her citizenship on national security grounds at the Special Immigration Appeals Commission. It's after she was found in a Syrian refugee camp following her travel to the country as a 15-year-old in 2015 to join the so-called Islamic State terror group. Earlier this year, three judges at the Court of Appeal unanimously dismissed her bid to overturn the SIAC decision. 
The Prime Minister says the UK is taking measures to protect itself from the epoch-defining challenge of an increasingly assertive China. It's after recent cyber attacks which saw hackers access millions of voters' personal details and target MPs and peers who've been critical of Beijing. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden is due to address Parliament today over the threats, with the Prime Minister insisting the government will stop at nothing to protect the British public. A, 20, a £200 million pound package of investments aimed at securing the future of the country's nuclear industry has been unveiled. Rishi Sunak has declared a critical national endeavour as he vows to strengthen the industry and boost jobs. He's introduced a new fund backed by £20 million pounds in public money to support growth in Barrow in Furness, the home of Britain's submarine programmes, and a further £180 million pounds a year over the next decade, which Downing Street says will provide grants to local organisations. The Crown Prosecution Service has been cleared of wrongdoing in accepting the plea of triple killer Valda Calacane without going to trial. Grace Amali Kuma and Barnaby Weber, along with school caretaker Ian Coates, were killed in June last year in a spate of knife attacks whilst Calacane was suffering from schizophrenia. He was sentenced to a hospital order instead of being sent to prison. His Majesty's Crown Prosecution Inspectorate said the correct decision was made in accepting pleas of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. And a review led by independent government adviser Dame Sara Khan has been published pointing to chilling levels of harassment, posing a serious threat to schools. It found more than 75% of the public feel they can't speak their mind and 27% have employed security or moved jobs or homes. As part of her review... Dame Sarah's recommending the establishment of an exclusion zone for protests outside of schools. She says victims need more support from police. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For a valuable legacy your family can own, Gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2642 and €1.1670. The price of gold is £1,720.15 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,898 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Welcome along to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. More wet weather to come throughout this week, really. Not too much today across parts of East Anglia and the southeast, but it is a pretty chilly start to the working week. Low pressure sitting just to the west of the UK, as it will be for the next several days. Weather fronts pushing northwards. Far northwest of Scotland, seeing some bright or even sunny spells. And as I mentioned, much of East Anglia and the southeast dry. But everywhere, it's drab, it's damp. And it's fairly breezy as well. Some heavy bursts of rain across the southwest and the wet weather turning to snow over the hills across eastern Scotland. Temperatures here really struggling, 6, 7 degrees at best. Further south, we might get to double digits, maybe 11 or 12 with a bit of brightness in the southeast, but still fairly chilly for the time of year. And it's going to be really cold rain in eastern Scotland this evening. We'll see more snow over the hills. That could cause some problems on the highest routes. The A9, for example, seeing some heavy snow for a time through the night. Elsewhere, the rain will tend to ease across a good chunk of England and Wales. Temperatures will fall down to single figures. Uh, but generally, a dry start for many on Tuesday. Still pretty cloudy and there is more rain to come, more snow to come for eastern Scotland. with Chiefly rain at lower levels, but this Zone of wet weather then works back across parts of the Midlands into Wales and across southeast England. So a much wetter day here. Something a bit brighter for South Wales and southwest England. But still, although we may get to double digits, most of us on the chilly side. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It is 20 to 2, and reports have suggested that Prince Harry and Princess Meghan... No. Do, 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 Duchess. Duchess. Duchess Meghan. Duchess Meghan. Or just Meghan is Markle. She, yeah, let's call her Meghan. <laughs> Only found out about the Princess of Wales' cancer diagnosis through television news. Yes, so the couple has since reached out to their sister-in-law, as well as Prince William, to offer their support. Well, the Prince of Wales has again asked for privacy during this difficult time, as he deals with both his wife and father's recent diagnoses. So for more on how the family is coping following the announcement is our Royal Correspondent Cameron Walker. Cameron, please bring us updates over the weekend. We had the shock, shocking news on Friday evening delivered to us all in the form of a video from the Princess of Wales herself, something that we haven't seen, mm. haven't seen anything like it, uh, really. Now we're hearing that Prince Harry and Meghan were only found out through the medium of, of the press. Yeah, I mean, put yourself in Prince William's shoes for a moment. This is a man who tragically lost his mother in the most horrific circumstances, aged 15. And him and his brother, I suppose, relied on he each other since that moment as they grew into adults uh, to support each other. And now, of course, that mutual support is gone. There's a literal ocean separating uh, the two of them. And I think you saw from the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's uh, message following Kate's disclosure of her cancer diagnosis that they want the two of them, William and Catherine, to be able to support each other in peace and privacy. Um, but the problem is, Prince William can no longer really rely on his brother now. 90% of GB News members, according to a poll on our website, says that Prince Harry should not come back to the UK to support his uh, brother, who's clearly obviously running out of senior members of the royal family to, to be part of the working firm. And he's had a huge issue, hasn't he? Because both his father and wife now have uh, have have cancer and he's having to support his three young children through it all at the same time but he's having to continue with royal duties now royal sources tell me the prince and princess of wales's priority is understandably their children at this time so we're not expecting to see prince william over the next three weeks but he'll be back uh, on public duties after easter for now they really want to prioritize their children in the privacy of their own home obviously as uh, princess catherine continues with her cancer treatment it's a really concerning time, I suppose. Uh, it's a really concerning time for so many people. And there were, of course, lots of jokes made. Lots of jokes made by people that perhaps should have known better in uh, the days and weeks leading up to the announcement. Do you know how the palace took that sort of intense scrutiny, even mockery, that so many uh, public figures and, and members of the public as well engaged in? I think on the one hand, they're very much seeing the fact that we've lost two senior members of the royal family temporarily is very much a blip rather than a crisis. So I think that's the first thing to point out. Clearly, there has been a lot of speculation and scrutiny online, and I think perhaps slightly unfairly, and I think most people who were saying those jokes on the internet are perhaps having second thoughts. Now we know exactly what is wrong uh, with the Princess of Wales. I mean, look at Prince William's achievements 
uh, in the last three months, despite all of this going on behind the scenes. We do know, by the way, that the reason Prince William pulled out of his godfather's memorial service was because of Kate's cancer diagnosis. I have had that confirmed. Uh, but with Earthshop, for example, he secured a deal or helped secure a deal to provide 75 million plastic-free items to 50 sports stadiums and entertainment venues across the country. He's uh, launched a, a online platform to match investors with um, climate solutions, and he's been helping out with homelessness as well uh, in Sheffield. And he kind of does all that despite all of this noise going on in the background with social media. Prince, uh, Prince William knows his destiny. He's going to be king and he will clearly have to rely on Princess Catherine and his three children to support him in that role. But at the moment, he is supporting them as a father and as a husband. Well, thank you very much, Cameron Walker. Very nicely put. Uh, Cameron Walker, our royal correspondent, there bringing us an update uh, from the royal family. Yeah, no, it was shocking. It was shocking when I when I saw that when six o'clock on on Friday evening. Um, I don't think many people expected it. No, and the amount of people who have uh, publicly apologised yes. uh, for making fun over the photoshopping and everything else and all those silly conspiracy theories that were out and about. Lots of people uh, apologising. Yes, as they should. But uh, but yes, uh, that's a, a lesson to everyone really in terms of speculation, I guess. But lots of you were getting in touch saying leave her alone and respect her privacy. Um, but Donald Trump is going to be back in court over the alleged hush money paid to porn star Stormy Daniels. We're going to be going live. Here are live pictures. There we go, outside the court. And we're expecting to see Donald Trump walking up into this courtroom very, very soon. We will bring you that as it happens. But of course, uh, we'll be back right there, live in New York, after this short break. Nana Queer, weekends from 3 p.m. Should we put tobacco star warnings on ultra processed foods? Boris Johnson is calling on the government to do this. In this Daily Mail column, the former prime minister says that people don't know what they're feeding their families and there's too many extra ingredients. That's why I'm asking should we put tobacco star warnings on ultra processed food? Well, joining me now to discuss Steve. We're taking you live now to a press conference where MPs who have been the victim of Chinese hacking are speaking. We will be going live. Ian Duncan Smith, we're expected we'll to hear from him. Much he greater support from their host governments. Neither we nor other parliamentary colleagues will be bullied into silence uh, by Beijing. For years, the behaviour of the Chinese government has gone unchecked. And we have been too passive here in the West, particularly here in the UK, as Beijing overseas influence operations have rapidly ex <coughs> expanded, turning a blind eye to what the Intelligence and Security Committee termed penetration of every sector of the UK economy, unquote. Still, incredibly, there is, there is a debate within the UK government, we understand, over whether or not China uh, should be in the enhanced tier of the new foreign influence registration scheme. Still, the UK has yet to impose a single sanction on officials responsible for the destruction of freedoms in Hong Kong, despite the UK being one of the two duty bearers with China under the Sino-British Joint Declaration. I remind everybody that the United States, by contrast, in the same period, has sanctioned over 40 people in Hong Kong. We have sanctioned none. We must now enter a new era of relations with China, dealing with the contemporary Chinese Communist Party as it really is, not as we would wish it to be. And today's announcement should mark an, an, a watershed moment where the UK takes a stand for values of human rights and the international rules-based system upon which we all depend. And therefore, we have, hopefully, four requests of the government when they get up to make their respective statements today. Number one, that China should immediately be labelled as a threat, not as an epoch-defining systemic challenge in the integrated review. Two, China should be in the enhanced tier of the foreign influence registration scheme, that there should be sanctions on those who are responsible for the abuses, uh, not just in Hong Kong, but obviously in Xinjiang and around the, air, uh, the whole of China's suzerainty, including Tibet, of course, and support for MPs and other victims of Beijing's transnational repression. Thank you very much indeed. Questions? Should we start left and right and we can pick them up? Yep. Thank you. Um, 
Sorry, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Sharing mics. Um, thank you, Andy Bell, um, Five News. Um, David Cameron is now the Foreign Secretary. He was the man who led the drive for the so-called golden era with China. Do you feel complete confidence that he's the man to push ahead with what you believe needs now to happen with the UK's attitude to China? Well, that was my colleagues start answering as well. So, Tim, do you want to say something about it? I think there has been a change in tone from the, uh, uh, the government uh, since David Cameron um, has arrived. Whether that's him trying to overcompensate from being the architect along with George Osborne of the uh, golden era, um, um, I don't know. But the events that have happened in the last few days uh, and what is going to be announced later on today by the uh, Deputy um, Prime Minister point to a very clear malign influence by China. And in the past, I know David Cameron and others have always stressed getting a balance between trading opportunities with the world's second largest economy and the risks uh, for security and their abuses of human um, rights. Uh, I think that the news and the statement we're going to get um, later about potential attacks that there have been, the press are recording against the Electoral uh, Commission, we'll hear uh, more about that later, and what has been going on against parliamentarians, show that the dial has very much swung towards the risk category, away from the opportunities category. And I hope David Cameron, when he presumably responds to this <coughs> in the House of Lords himself, will acknowledge um, that. And I think that would yeah. certainly chime with the feeling of parliamentarians on both sides of the House now as to how we view China. Yeah, I think there's just another thing to say sure. here. I mean, the the focus obviously is on David Cameron as the Foreign Secretary, I get that. But there was a consensus 10, 12, 15 years ago across politics, across business, across academia that this was a good thing, this, this golden era was a good thing. What we now need is a new consensus, a new consensus that, as we've said, deals with China as it is. Uh, what it's doing domestically, but also what it's doing here to parliamentarians elected by members of the public to represent them. Uh, but also what's happening to Hong Kong dissidents uh, in this country as well, and others who are being persecuted and targeted. I've been here before, but with Russia, so I know what this is like. And what we need to see is this, the same kind of urgency to develop a new consensus that deals with China as it is, nor is this kind of um, mm. sweet meal that we can try and milk and only get the good parts when we're very much not just getting the good parts. Can I just get the other hands came up and then we can come back quickly because while well, you get the microphone moved across there and then back at the BBC. Right, well, oh, look, okay, well, yeah. Uh, Libby, 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 yeah, Libby, yeah. The fact is that uh, the trade between Britain and China is now worth something in the region of 100 billion pounds. Are you saying to the government that they need to think again as to whether we should leave our economy that exposed? Uh, in terms of uh, whether we can actually protect our citizens at the same time. Can I? Yeah, you far away. Th this threat about the impact it will have on countries' mm. trade if they dare to stand up and call out China's uh, abuses uh, is a fiction. Every country which has done that has actually seen subsequently an increase in its trade yeah. with China. The only time we saw a downturn in trade with China in the UK uh, was in about eight or nine years ago, in the midst of the golden um, era. It is a complete fallacy that if you call out China, instantly all the trade and investment opportunities um, dry up. Briefly, um, Ian Duncan Smith, I can ask you, as a former leader of the Conservative Party, whether you think Britain's democracy has actually been compromised by this mass cyber attack? Well, there's no question that's what uh, those malign uh, entities would want it to happen. Uh, if you ask me, have we been fast enough uh, and quick enough and focused enough to deal with it, the answer has to be no. Uh, not for want of trying by the security services, I have to tell you, because I think they've been well aware of what this was. I go back to uh, 2020, when some of us opposed the uh, entry of Huawei into 5G. Uh, I thought the government received bad advice about that, as to whether you control it. Eventually, we were able to demonstrate that was not the case, and it was politicians, parliamentarians, that actually opposed that and stopped it. So uh, what we've hoped for ever since is that that should not be the case. Most of us were sanctioned, those of us were sanctioned, because we had unearthed 
the uh, Xinjiang genocide. And it is a genocide. Uh, even the UN have suggested that that is necessarily the case. Uh, because we got that to everybody around the world, these were official documents. Uh, China was furious with those of us as individuals as well. And even though the government sanctioned three very lowly officials, they went ahead and sanctioned ten of us, including one uh, legal chambers. So uh, the reality is even the balance isn't correct right now, so it needs to be reset. But certainly we need to be much stronger and tougher. And if you're tough with people, the lesson we learned from the 1930s, appeasement never works. If you're strong, you tell them what's wrong and you tell them you're not going to put up with it, then eventually they will probably back down. But if you don't, they just keep taking advantage yep. of you, and that's our biggest problem. Yes, and then the BBC. I'll take that. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Beth B. Sky News. Just a, just a couple of questions, if I may. The, the first one, when you talk about resetting relations or a new watershed moment, you also suggest there are still divisions within government about the direction of travel. Is the Prime Minister on the wrong side of that, given it is he today who talked about an epoch-defining challenge rather than explicitly saying China's a threat. Can you flesh that out a bit? And for all of you, this has been going on for some time for all of you, and the Electoral Commission um, attempts of cyber attacks happened back in 2021-22. It's only now uh, that the Prime Minister is moving on it, and if I may, is there an element too here of party politics for a prime minister that is struggling with his backbenches? He's been in a row about Rwanda, and he's trying to perhaps bring this now. Why now, in order to perhaps unify the party a bit, going into recess? Is there domestic politics at play here? Uh, no, I don't think it's the way you say it at all. I wouldn't, uh, in your latter question, I certainly wouldn't think that that would be the case because I think most MPs are already clear that China is a threat. I mean, we don't go around in the tea rooms talking to each other about, my gosh, have you seen how epoch defend, how challenging they are in an epoch sense uh, <laughs> over a cup of tea with each other? What we talk about is the threat. So the question really is what kind of advice is the government getting on that? And uh, we need to, as they say, call a spade a spade. And the reality is that they are a threat. They're a threat to, I mean, you talk to businesses, a lot of medium businesses are moving out of China now because they get their IP stolen yeah. and they can't deal with them. The legal system around them doesn't work. So they're beginning to move away. I noticed that Apple moved their telephone manufacturer to India uh, because they're now beginning to worry about it. This is only damaging to China at the end of the day, so we should stand up call them what they are, and then say, if you deal with us, you deal, deal with us on the basis that we don't fully trust you. But, but just to follow up on that... I was just going to go call. Follow up on that. What You said that there are still divisions within government in your statement about how to deal with this threat. Well, inevitably, otherwise we would have an absolute settled order, and we don't. But it's not about the divisions that I'm after. These are arguments and debates about how far do you go, which is quite normal, I think. The question really is for us, it is really now time for us to recognize, particularly with what we may well be seeing uh, concerning the Electoral Commission stuff, that, that they are, have a malign influence and therefore they have become a threat. And I think it's time we call them that. I don't know who you Can I add, add to yeah. that? I, I, if you remember, when we had a vote in Parliament on genocide, it was unanimous. There's, yeah. there's no division yeah. amongst parliamentarians. And it's not a party political um, <clears throat> matter. Where there is, I think, still a grey area is the attitude of the Foreign Office in particular, which doesn't like to rock the boat on these uh, matters, and how much ministers may challenge um, that. Hopefully now ministers will challenge that uh, much more readily. To go back to your earlier point, and this is a question for the Deputy Prime Minister this afternoon and for press as, uh, as well, is for attacks which may have happened back in 2021, uh, there now is going to be action two and a half, three years um, later. And certainly that remains something of a mystery yep. uh, to us. And what pressure may have there have been from some of our Five Eyes partners uh, and others where there have been more recent attacks and they've responded rather yeah. more um, speedily. So that is certainly a challenge of the government, why it's taken so long, mm -hmm. it would appear, uh, for this now to be acted on. Yeah. The point is I got the point in the back, is actually. the party can at least unify around this issue behind the Prime Minister in some way. Well, we want, all we're saying is that the, the, the Parliament is united uh, already, and it's self-evident, really, that is the case. And we just, therefore, want the government to take the right action. They are a threat. We ought to call them a threat. And that then populates all the other arguments that take place inside Parliament. Paul Mason. Oh, sorry. Cheers. <clears throat> 
Thank you, Chris Mason from BBC News. Uh, could you set out in as precise terms as you can what you have had to put up with as individuals? You talked to Ian about uh, impersonation, attempted hacking. I'm just interested to hear precisely how it has been for you. And then just one additional question. So, Ian, you made a comparison a few moments ago with the 1930s. That's obviously a, a stark comparison. Is, is that the scale of the threat that you see in terms of the threat the UK faces from China, that comparison with nearly a century ago? Well, let me start because the others will obviously have their own views. Uh, personally, <coughs> I've had a wolf warrior uh, that was impersonating me for some time. Uh, using a fake email address, uh, emailing all sorts of politicians around the world, saying that uh, <coughs> I'd recanted my views, also saying basically that I was a liar, all these sort of things to various people. I only came to know about it because I know some of them, and they were sending this back to me to say, why are you sending me emails uh, recanting and basically calling yourself a liar? And I was able to explain to them it's not my email address and it's not me. I won't say what happened, but eventually he went quiet. Um, uh, we did know where he was in due course. But so that's one of the things. The other thing is we know that many of us have had hacking attempts, some fairly shallow attempts, but nonetheless hacking, and some more serious. Uh, so those are the experience. I'm not alone in those personal experiences, but the others too. I don't know whether sure, you, of course, have this mm. whole experience with Russia as well. Yes, yeah, so I, I was yeah. I was here about a year ago uh, with Russia, where the the bit that doesn't get talked about in the parliamentary state and the targeting of parliament is the staff front. It doesn't get talked about enough. Mm. And when I was uh, targeted by Russia a year ago, that was via a member of my staff. Um, but I want to address your, your point on the scale of the challenge. When I talk about the need for this new consensus, I mean, this affects every single part of our society. It would be wrong to see this as just a, a faraway foreign policy issue. This is about our energy sector, it's about our economy, it's about our universities, it's about our political system, uh, our critical national infrastructure. It goes into everything. And, you know, if I can tap onto Beth's question, at least the Tories are having this discussion in robust terms. Politics has got so much catching up to do. And Ian is right. Industry and business is further ahead uh, than government and politics in general. We're already seeing de-risking or decoupling, however you want to, to phrase that, happening. Politics and the institutions of politics and government badly needs to catch up. Because not only will this keep happening, it will get worse and worse and worse. And we can't let that happen. Can I, just to get back, I mean, tomorrow is the third anniversary of when seven parliamentarians were yeah. uh, sanctioned, which yeah, we found out out of, the, uh, out of the blue. We were never mm. actually written to individually by the Chinese Communist Party government saying, dear Mr Lawton, we're just dropping you a note to say you've been sanctioned. <laughs> uh, we were told that involves uh, ourselves and our families unable to travel to, uh, to China and, uh, and Hong Kong. Our business assets uh, seized and we're not allowed to do a business which, uh, which is academic, I think, for, uh, uh, for all of us. Uh, over that last three years, various um, colleagues who aren't here as, uh, as, as well have had hacking um, attempts, a lot of impersonation. I'm constantly getting emails or tweets from Tom Tugnat saying he has resigned in disgust at the yeah. government's policy on such and such, for, it, uh, for example. Yesterday we had a, uh, a tweet from the um, Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Human Rights Commission, which I chair, which has also been uh, uh, sanctioned, uh, pouring um, abuse over um, the head of Hong Kong uh, watch, for example. This happens all the, all the time. Um, what we're particularly concerned about, though, is those uh, Uyghurs and Tibetans that are in this country or elsewhere that we have associated yeah. with yeah. Uh, in confidence, whose families have then been contacted or threats emanating out of China to the families of distance back at home as well. And they, as, as we put in the statement, where we have the most concern, it's caused quite a lot of inconvenience and um, uh, an intimidation for, for us, but that's nothing compared with those braver people who are in the yeah. front, uh, front line. And you'll notice that some of the, the, the people <coughs> that work here have been named in the case against Jimmy Lai, quite wrongly, yeah. uh, which is an outrage, and of course it's um, an outrageous prosecution in the first place. Uh, but we had also a spy investigation, which is still ongoing. Yeah. Uh, we've also had a co um, uh, an individual that was uh, working with somebody who the intelligence services felt was a spy. He was actually wandering around the building. At that time, we were dealing with a lot of Hong Kong 
uh, people trying to get out. So we had lots. Well, of we've been listening to the Interparliamentary Alliance on China. Three speakers from that group over the threat from China, the cyber attack that China has uh, has has delivered on the United Kingdom, uh, and we have there Sir Ian Duncan Smith, former Conservative Party leader, former Work and Pension Secretary, saying that China must now be labelled as a threat. Yes, very interesting to hear their personal experiences of being hacked. Ian Duncan Smith talking about how he had someone impersonating him and sending all sorts of emails to very important people. Should we speak to our Home and Security editor, Mark White, who has been keeping abreast of everything that's been going on here? Um, Mark, what stuck out to you um, from what we just heard? A lot of talk about the direction of travel, the need for a new consensus when it comes to relations with China. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you heard there from those politicians who were saying really that we need to be much more robust in our relationship with China, that it is no longer acceptable just to talk about an, uh, an epoch-defining challenge, that you've got to call it what it is, and that is a threat. And, of course, these MPs who have been uh, holding this news conference know only too well just what that means. Sir Ian Duncan Smith himself saying how he has had people uh, impersonating, hacking him, uh, sending off emails uh, around the world to contacts of his, saying that he's recanted his previous views on China, other, he says, more um, uh, attacks at hacking him, and other MPs there, not just China, but Russia involved in this as well. So they clearly want to see uh, a different approach, uh, to be more assertive in the way that the UK deals with China. Let's see what uh, Oliver Dowden, the Deputy Prime Minister says when he speaks to the House of Commons at 3.30 this afternoon. It's a difficult one because, of course, China, for all of the issues surrounding the security challenges, is very vital uh, to the UK's economy, £100 billion in trade uh, over the past year with China. So you can understand perhaps a certain reluctance to go too far down the road of creating a hostile state out of China. Now, Mark, there's been another breaking story in the last hour, that of Shamima Begum. She's lost an initial bid to challenge the removal of her British citizenship, this time at the Supreme Court. Yes, indeed, and, and some uh, other news on this a never-ending saga. It's still not going to end uh, for potentially a while yet, because although what we had today was the Court of Appeal effectively denying Shamima Begum the chance to go to the Supreme Court, that is not the only avenue open to her. She will be able to apply directly to the Supreme Court to hear that appeal against the stripping of her British citizenship. Uh, and I think uh, it's unimaginable that uh, her legal team would not proceed with that claim directly to the Supreme Court uh, to try to get uh, a full hearing so that they can argue that this was an unlawful uh, act by the then Home Secretary Sajid Javid uh, to strip her of her British citizenship uh, in 2019. It was February 2019. Remember, just weeks after she had popped up at this um, refugee camp in northern Syria, having fled um, uh, that, that country, or at least uh, Aleppo, uh, where the fighting was uh, in, in, the, in, uh, in Syria, uh, to, to mm. then call for uh, her return to the UK. Well, Sajid Javid uh, stripped her of her citizenship uh, in this country because uh, of the fact that she had the entitlement uh, to claim uh, citizenship of Bangladesh. Her parents uh, were Bangladeshi and she had that right at that time. So he was not making her stateless. So in law, um, the, the government at the time anyway, uh, was not erring in law. And 
at every step through the court process here. It has gone against Shamima Begum, but our lawyers have continued to fight this um, from court to court. And I think the next step will be that they will uh, apply directly to the Supreme Court. How far that gets uh, remains to be seen. But I think we've got a few months left to run on this. Yeah, Mark, uh, we could see a change of government quite soon. Do you imagine that perhaps a Labour government might be more sympathetic to her plight? Of course, it was Sajid Javid who removed her British citizenship. Could that be restored? How do you see this playing out in terms of the politics too? Well, I think those that are very concerned about a potential return of Shamima Begum will be concerned about the potential for there to be a more sympathetic year uh, if Labour was to get into power. Uh, certainly those, some within the party, have suggested that uh, over the years that uh, she should be brought back to the UK and put before the UK courts. The difficulty with that is that actually the... Um, assessments that were made about Shamima Begum and the threat that she poses to the UK are assessments that were based on intelligence sources, human intelligence and other intelligence sources from Syria, which, although they are strong enough to have persuaded the courts uh, in form of the Special Immigration Appeals Commission, which originally decided on her case, that she was indeed a threat. Mm. Intelligence such as the fact that she was a member of the uh, Islamic State's so-called morality police, uh, that she had been involved in sewing uh, suicide vo uh, bombers into their vests, and that she did indeed pose a real and significant threat to the UK. Although there is that intelligence there, it doesn't mean that there is that evidence that you can then put before a court that crosses that threshold that would mean that prosecutors would be confident that this would be a case that they could try in the UK court. So that's always the difficulty of bringing her back here. And it might be if she ever was brought back here that she wouldn't face a trial in this country because there wouldn't be the evidence they could put before the courts. Mm -hmm. And instead, there would have to be other measures, costly measures, mm -hmm. to ensure that she was under constant surveillance by the police and security services. Concerning prospects. Uh, Mark White, thank you very much for bringing us that. We're just going to cross now to some latest pictures because Donald Trump has arrived now at court in New York for his hush money Stormy Daniels case. <laughs> there he is. The Donald Trump, former president. Many, many reporters there, and Donald Trump standing, posing for photographs yes, he outside was. this courthouse in New York. He walked there fairly slowly, stopped, posed, and then walked in. And I think that tells us something about the politics of this case. We've seen that within the Republican primary, before Donald Trump became the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party, whenever there was one of these legal cases in New York, in Florida, or federal cases too, he would go up in the polls. His mugshot became uh, an, an item, a, a, a T-shirt uh, image that was sold by the campaign. It became instantly one of those most famous images. He's he very much using takes advantage this. of it, doesn't he? He's using this for his own political gains. And this is one of the big questions. Will this be a big, big backfiring sense? The sense that there's some sort of uh, political prosecution here? more than just a legal one. Yes, how will it affect his prospects for the all-important presidential election that's upcoming? Hmm. Well, we're going to touch on that with one of his former advisers in just a moment. But uh, for the meantime, Labour's plans to make the UK's electricity grid zero carbon by 2030 is expected now to cost an extra £116 billion of taxpayers' money. This from New Analysis today. Yes, and it also comes as the Conservatives have already committed to a net zero power system by 2035. So uh, Labour, they say they're going to get it zero carbon by 2030. The Conservatives still sticking with the uh, 2035. It shows the enormous difference between the two parties, One doesn't it? The same, it? the same policy five years apart. Uh, let's speak now to James Brown, the head of communications of Britain Remade. James, thanks for making the time for us today. Frankly, is it possible? 
to get a zero carbon electricity grid by 2030? It is possible. Uh, you have to take uh, some uh, quite uh, focused steps, uh, whether it's the Labour Party or the Conservative Party, but uh, you can get to a zero, zero carbon grid by 2030. You have to fix the planning system fundamentally, though, to be able to deliver that. So you can get space in the ground on the clean energy projects that will deliver it, be that onshore wind, offshore mm -hmm. wind, floating wind or new nuclear. Are the technologies there, though? We were talking to Angela Knight, who was the chief executive of Energy UK, the trade association for the energy industry, and she said this is fantasy. She said even the current government's commitment to getting to carbon zero on our electricity grid by 2035 is almost fantasy. The technologies are there. If you look at the progress that the UK has made in offshore wind over the last 15 years, the technology is most definitely there. Not only does the UK have the biggest offshore wind farm in the world, the top five offshore wind farms in the world are in UK waters. In fact, out of the top 10, seven of them are in UK waters. So we do have the technologies, but we also need to develop those technologies further as well. That's why we need to invest in things like floating offshore uh, wind farms so we can build... Where's all the money coming from, bigger. though, James? Where's all the money coming from? Because we get these big figures, like $116 billion, and, of course, that will be an estimate based on uh, how much these things cost now and how much they're projected to cost. But who's going to pay for this? You know, lots of people saying that, actually... This is going to hit the poorest the hardest, this, this drive to reach this zero carbon. The reality is that renewables, offshore wind, solar are the cheapest forms of energy we have. They are cheaper than gas. They are cheaper than anything else. Well, that hang on, is that true, though? Grid. Is that true, though? Because uh, to mention Angela again, she did make it clear that, yes, they are cheaper on the face of it, but actually because they require a base load, they require storage capacity because they're intermittent, that actually it's a bit of a, a falsehood. It's a bit of a falsehood that they're cheaper. So if you look at the strike price of renewables, they are lower than gas, they are lower than uh, every, anything else that goes into the grid. And you, you do need base load. We do need to invest in new nuclear. We do need to invest in short-term and long-term storage. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do these things. Mm. I suppose one of the ways in which we can facilitate this is by uh, the changing fundamentally the way that we power our own households, installing very expensive batteries in our garages, all the rest of it. I mean, this is going to be a very, very expensive uh, project, especially if it's going to happen in just six years' time. Uh, frankly, uh, can the country afford it? The question is, can we afford not to do it? If we, if we want to make sure people have energy bills that are affordable, that um, are not reliant on fossil fuels, then we do need to invest in all forms of energy, from new nuclear at the gigawatt scale to you know, state-of-the-art uh, small, modu small modular reactors to offshore wind, onshore wind, you know, and there will always be a mix of energy in the, the grid and we just need to keep investing. James, I take your point, but there is a concern that the government might get uh, these technologies that they choose wrong. So they might think that X technology is the best way to get us to green. Um, but actually, it turns out that it's not the cheapest or efficient. And the next year, there's a new technology. Is the government capable of planning so far ahead? So the, 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 West, the best way to uh, pick a technology is uh, to put uh, market mechanisms in place and leave it to the market. That's what we've seen with offshore wind uh, and onshore wind with the contact, contract for difference policy that the government implemented um, 10, 15 years ago. And it's that contract for difference policy that has driven down the price of renewable mm -hmm. energy.
Now, I think that's a really important point to make. Renewable energy is now a lot cheaper than it was even a decade ago. Mm. Uh, and so let's hope that these costs keep coming down, yeah. that there are ways to get it done cheaply. But my goodness, what a task there lies ahead for whoever wins the next election. James Brown, for now, uh, the head of communications at Britain Remade. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because you hear wind and solar is cheaper than mm. fossil fuels, but then actually, with all the infrastructure that comes with it, with all the extra needs that it requires, yeah. is it actually? What happens when it's, about, uh, when it's not a windy day, when it's not a sunny day? And we're talking about all the millions of tonnes of steel we need for new pylons yes. and all the rest. I mean, that's carbon intensive, isn't it? I don't think our steel making is uh, green yet, although they are trying, well, which I has put people out of work. Although, I don't know, have you seen the new design for some of these pylons connected to oh, some go of on the then, tell me. Oh, they look lovely. They're, they're not. They're not this sort of um, steel lattice structures. They're sort of white and a single pole that goes up, and they're called T pylons. I'll see if we can get some images. Oh, well, there we go. Program, An attractive nice. pylon. I think that. I think I would like a pylon like that. In, would you like a pylon my... outside your window? Yeah, I'd love it. Beautiful one. Big, ah, beautiful pylon. Lies, lies. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Tom wants a pylon outside his window? I'd like a house uh, first. You'd like a house first. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Would you have a pylon outside your window? Um, coming up, we're going to be speaking to one of Donald Trump's former deputy assistants as he appears in court for his Stormy Daniels hush money case. How will this impact his chances to become the next president? is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, what's going on in Scotland? So they're implementing these draconian hate speech laws, which are going to come in, into force on April the 1st, I kid you oh, not. Ironically, yeah. And then, um, basically, you can go to your local mushroom shop or whatever. Which I didn't know we had mushrooms farms in Scotland no. because people aren't that keen on vegetables up the road. They're, they're... Um, <laughs> but, not even a shiitake. But, um, but you can report a hate crime at these private... Pla but you can do it anonymously, and then the police will, uh, I don't know, unleash the hate monster. I, I don't know what, how this works. What's going on? I think the hate monster... <laughs> <laughs> is mythical, yes. and um, I don't think the hate monster actually exists. What I do think is exists. I'm genuinely really worried about comedy, right? Yeah. Now, believe it or not, some people in Scotland, they're wrong, but they don't like me. Yeah. And I genuinely feel that a lot of time is going to be wasted. You know, if someone yeah. calls you a name in a shop, you probably deserved it, believe me. Um, also, called... comedy can be quite offensive, particularly yours. And I'm not necessarily sure. As I've said on the show before, I remember my mum was worried when we, we, Scotland had decided that all um, residential properties needed special smoke alarms, and my mum was convinced this was to do with the hate crime and that there was a camera in them. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think she's being that paranoid. I mean, <laughs> Scotland is a kind of nanny state. You know, actually, Hamza Youssef, when he implemented the hate crime bill, put a, a subsection in that which said that they can criminalise you for things you've said in the privacy of your own home. Thankfully, Scotland doesn't have the largest arts festival in the world. Oh, wait, oh, no, it does, no. it does. It actually does have that. And lots of comedians are up there. Now, we had this before, because if you go back about to, uh, to 2000 and, what was it, 2003, when New Labour were trying to push through their racial and religious hate crime bill, the comedians are silent now. Something has completely changed. There's been a gear shift. Oh, I mean, in the Irish hate crime bill, which is, it, it, which is going through at the moment, they actually define hatred as hatred. Brilliant. It's a complete circular definition. Well, yeah, well, absolutely. And that tells me, when something's woolly, that tells me that it's not going to be applied fairly. It's going to be applied according to the person applying it. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Good afternoon, Britain. It's 23 minutes past two, and it's a race against time for the former President Donald Trump, the US president, that is, as he faces two huge cases, both in New York today. Yes, a pivotal day in his uh, legal saga. Trump is currently attending a hearing in Manhattan over the alleged hush money payment he made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. These are some of the pictures from the last few minutes. Donald Trump posing. Where is he? There he is. Coming out. Posing to the cameras. Yeah, and I think this says it all, doesn't it? He's walking out slowly. He stops and he looks up. He's almost sneering a bit at the media there. Nose in the air. But he knows. He knows that these photographs actually help him. We know that, we know that his mugshot in a completely unrelated case became one of the images of last year and no doubt helped propel his candidacy. His face be on the uh, campaign literature. Yes. On the T-shirts, on the, uh, the caps. Anyway, joining us now is one of Trump's former deputy assistants, Sebastian Gorka. Sebastian, thank you very much for coming on the show this afternoon. Uh, very interested to hear your take on all of this. This is a big day for Donald Trump. Oh, I don't think we can hear Sebastian there. Can let's, we reconnect his line? Let's see if um, we can get that audio can sorted me? out. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? hello, we can hear you now, Sebastian. I hope you can hear me, guys. Are you there? We can hear, we can hear you now loud and clear. Uh, how do you think today is going to go? Have you got me now? We've got you, Sebastian. Got We've got you. OK. So, yeah, it's, it's a sad day for America. And you're right, the, uh, the booking photograph from Atlanta, it's what I use as my, my Twitter photograph, <laughs> and it's become iconic because Americans love an outlaw. But this is a case not of, you know, Jesse James. This is a case of political prosecutions. Let's uh, look at the, the half a billion dollar bail that has been demanded of him in the other trial in New York. For what? A fraud case in which there were no victims, no one was defrauded. And the amount, this historic amount, $430 million that has been demanded by this insane judge, happens to just be the same amount of cash President Trump has on hand for his campaign. So the right way to look at, at all of this is campaign interference. If we had a fair election today, the latest polling demonstrates it would be a complete trouncing of the incumbent Joe Biden. They're afraid that the American people will choose my former boss as the 47th president, and this is how they think they can stop him. Now, I suppose those prosecuting this action will say that uh, these are the courts of a, of a country that are presumed to be free and fair. Yes, there might have been uh, perhaps uh, uh, the reason these have gone after uh, uh, might, might be political, but these are legitimate cases. Perhaps, perhaps you could prosecute a case like this against any businessman because people will have slipped up in, in the past and uh, perhaps cut corners. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the courts have found the wrong answers. Well, I'll just repeat what is the case with regards to Judge Engeron. There were no victims. There was no one defrauded. In fact, the banks that provided the loans to President Trump actually testified in court and said, we would like President Trump back as a client because he paid back early, he paid back with interest, and he's a great, great investment. So if the bank that the lunatic judge said was defrauded, says, we weren't defrauded and we'd like him back as a mm. client, you realise these are just show trials. Well, Sebastian, do you believe any of the cases against Donald Trump are fair and legitimate? No, they're, they're insane. I mean, look at, look at the one here in D.C. where I'm sitting. Judge Chutkan that is prosecuting the president for so-called insurrection. We find out what? She was a colleague at the same law firm for 12 years in D.C. with none other than Hunter Biden. I mean, can you see a more explicit conflict of interest that you're the judge in a political case against the leader of the opposition and you were bosom buddies with the son of the current incumbent? It's farcical. It's like a Kafka novel. That does seem a little bit like a stretch. I don't think that all of my former colleagues would necessarily mean that I'm, I'm busy, bosom buddies with any... Anyway, uh, let's get back to the no, point no, here, but, because... no, no, but you can't be a judge. No, hang, hang on. You can't be a judge. I mean, it's, it's very important in, in law. It's not just the 
probity of a case, the mm. appearance of probity, right? It's if you were colleagues with the son of the man who this person can actually beat in an election, you should recuse yourself. Mm. That's what we demand. Now, let's get to this issue of the $450 million, £350 million, pounds, an enormous amount of money. There is some uh, uh, concern that if today does not go Trump's way, the bailiffs could be round and his yeah. property could be seized. Yeah, so let, let's just dissect this for a moment. This never before in history, not with Al Capone, nobody you know, has been demanded to pay half a billion dollars in bail money before they're allowed to appeal. Think about that. The judge is saying you're not allowed to appeal the first instance unless you deposit $430 billion in cash. If the president cannot do so or refuses to do so, the lieutenant the attorney general of the state of New York, who campaigned, because uh, sadly she was elected, campaigned on putting President Trump in prison, uh, she's going to start seizing his assets. Now, think about this. A crime without any victims, therefore not a crime. Mm -hmm. Who gets the $400 million? She said the state of New York gets it because there are no victims. That is a, exactly the definition of communism. You take private property from an individual and you use the courts, you use the, the, the system to steal it for the state. That's communism we are witnessing, sadly, in the state of New York. The, the state of New York might say in this instance that there was money owed to the state of New York, the lost interest <laughs> on that. I believe that's how you get this enormous figure. So they might say that the people who've lost out here, perhaps no individual, but every New York taxpayer. But lost interest on what? The, the, we're talking about private loans from private banks to the Trump organization, loans that were paid back in time, in fact, often early, with full interest. Who, 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 whose interest are we talking about? So, some mythical taxpayer in New York that had nothing to do with the original deal? It's fantasy. It's la-la land. So, Sebastian, how do you see this playing out, then, for Donald Trump? He's doing uh, pretty well in the polls. Uh, he could be the next president of the United States. Uh, how do you see this going today and in the run-up to the election? Well, look, I don't do predictions because predictions are mugs game. Nobody gets challenged about what they said six months ago when they predicted something. But I'll look at a fact pattern. I'll look at a trend line. In the last two years, every single time something like this has been done to the president, whether it's the FBI with armed goons raiding his home at Mar-a-Lago, whether it's the Alvin Bragg indictment in New York, whether it's Engeron, whether it's Chutkan, whether it's any one of these, you know, black-robed thugs, every time there's a new indictment, he gets more popular and he raises more money. I mean, th this is the insanity of the Democrat Party. They're so driven and hostages to their own hatred and ideology, they're actually making him stronger than he's ever been before. It's like that last scene from Star Wars. You know, if you strike me down, Darth, I will be more powerful than you can ever imagine. <laughs> President Trump is stronger than he's... If, literally, if you look at the polls, He's got 26% of the black population, more than 45% of the Hispanic population. Uh, the, the trend line amongst the youth, which is kind of surprising, is going towards President Trump. And as a result, he would win an election today, but they can't stand it, so they want to put him in prison or worse. Uh, it's something we discuss a lot on this channel, actually. Incumbents the world over, whether it's Justin Trudeau, Rishi Sunak, Joe Biden, yeah. Martin Schultz, they're all behind in the yeah. polls. It does seem like it's a tough time to be defending a position uh, if you're in the executive of a, of a Western nation. Uh, but, uh, Sebastian Gorka, thank you very much for talking through what is an enormous day in New York today. We'll be uh, keeping a keen eye on how it plays out. We will indeed. But thank coming you, up, we will bring you some breaking news with our political editor, Christopher Hope, you won't want to miss it. That's right after your headlines. Emily, thank you. The top stories is our the Prime Minister says the UK is taking measures to protect itself from the epoch-defining challenge of an increasingly assertive China. It's after recent cyber attacks which saw hackers access millions of voters' personal details and target MPs and peers who've been critical of Beijing. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden is due to address Parliament today over the threats, with the Prime Minister insisting the government will stop at nothing to protect the British public. Former Conservative leader Sir Ian Duncan Smith has urged the government to take tougher action. 
We must now enter a new era of relations with China, dealing with the contemporary Chinese Communist Party as it really is, not as we would wish it to be. And today's announcement should mark an, an, a watershed moment where the UK takes a stand for values of human rights and the international rules-based system upon which we all depend. China should immediately be labelled as a threat, not as an epoch-defining systemic challenge in the integrated review. A £200 million package of investment aimed at securing the future of the country's nuclear industry has been unveiled. Rishi Sunak has declared a critical national endeavour as he vows to strengthen the industry and to boost jobs. He's introduced a new fund backed by £20 million in public money to support growth in Barrow and Finesse, the home of Britain's submarine programmes, and a further £180 million a year over the next decade, which Downing Street says will provide grants to local organisations. Former ISIS bride Shamima Begum has lost an appeal bid to challenge the removal of her British citizenship at the Supreme Court. Last year, Ms Begum lost her first appeal against the decision to revoke her citizenship on national security grounds at the Special Immigration Appeals Commission. It's after she was found in a Syrian refugee camp following her travel to the country as a 15-year-old in 2015 to join the so-called Islamic State terror group. Earlier this year, three judges at the Court of Appeal unanimously dismissed her bid to overturn the SIAC decision. The CPS has been cleared of wrongdoing in accepting the plea of triple killer Valdo Calacane without going to trial. Grocer Malikuma and Barnaby Weber, along with school caretaker Ian Coates, were killed in June last year in a spate of knife attacks while Calacane was suffering from schizophrenia. He was sentenced to a hospital order instead of being sent to prison. His Majesty's Crown Prosecution Inspectorate said the correct decision was made in accepting pleas of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Welcome along to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. More wet weather to come throughout this week, really. Not too much today across parts of East Anglia and the southeast, but it is a pretty chilly start to the working week. Low pressure sitting just to the west of the UK, as it will be for the next several days. Weather fronts pushing northwards. Far northwest of Scotland, seeing some bright or even sunny spells. And as I mentioned, much of East Anglia and the southeast dry. But everywhere, it's drab, it's damp. And it's fairly breezy as well. Some heavy bursts of rain across the southwest and the wet weather turning to snow over the hills across eastern Scotland. Temperatures here really struggling, 6, 7 degrees at best. Further south, we might get to double digits, maybe 11 or 12 with a bit of brightness in the southeast, but still fairly chilly for the time of year. And it's going to be really cold rain in eastern Scotland this evening. We'll see more snow over the hills. That could cause some problems on the highest routes. The A9, for example, seeing some heavy snow for a time through the night. Elsewhere, the rain will tend to ease across a good chunk of England and Wales. Temperatures will fall down to single figures. Uh, but generally, a dry start for many on Tuesday. Still pretty cloudy and there is more rain to come, more snow to come for eastern Scotland. With chiefly rain at lower levels, but this zone of wet weather then works back across parts of the Midlands into Wales and across southeast England so a much wetter day here something a bit brighter for South Wales and southwest England but still although we may get to double digits most of us on the chilly side big news big debates big opinion Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show every weekday 9 to 11 p.m. we've got the inside track on the day's top stories there'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else we will set the news agenda not just follow it and I want to bring you along for the ride whatever it is we'll have our finger on the pulse it's news but it's this close to entertainment Patrick Christie's tonight 9 to 11 p.m. only on GB News the people's channel Britain's news channel I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 38 minutes past two and we're going to cross straight over to our political editor, Christopher Hope, who has some breaking news for us. Chris, what's the news? Hi, Tom. Hi, Emily. Yes, we can reveal on GB News that Scott Benton, uh, the independent MP for Blackpool South, has resigned as an MP today with immediate effect. He's written to um, the Chancellor, uh, Jeremy Hunt. That's because the, the Jeremy Hunt is somebody who then um, administers the formal leaving uh, of an MP from Parliament. Um, He's written today uh, to his local people in Blackpool South. It's with a heavy heart that I have written to the Chancellor this morning to tender my resignation as your MP. I'd like to thank the hundreds of residents who have been sent supportive messages, cards and letters over the past few months and have urged me to continue and fight for the next general election. He had to, he has chosen to quit as an MP because he was banned from Parliament for 35 days after being caught up in a lobbying scandal um, by the Times newspaper. Any more than 10 days normally would trigger um, a referendum on a re recall by-election. He's chosen to act ahead of that and quit as an MP. It's a huge headache for Rishi Sunak. It bring, there's now, uh, I, I'm getting numbers on my phone here, but um, he has faced repeated tests at the ballot box since he became Prime Minister in October 2022. Um, he hasn't won many of them. It's another blow, and this majority that Scott Menton has uh, in Blackpool South is not very big. It'll be hard to defend. He won the 2019 general election there with a with um, a, 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 a quite a low majority, around 4,000. Um, I think it's one that Labour will, will want to win. This by-election is likely to happen before Parliament breaks up for the summer recess, so we can see it probably happening in late May, early June. A huge test for Rishi, Rishi Sunak, a test he doesn't want. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Christopher Hope there, our political editor, bringing us that latest mm. news that uh, Scott Benton is stepping down and there will be a by-election in Blackpool South. I mean, Christopher's saying there that this will be a very tightly contested... Well, it was tightly contested. It was. And now Labour will very much be gunning for this. Seat. It would be very surprising if Labour did not win mm. this, but there are confounding factors. I mean, there's George Galloway's party, there's the Reform Party, there's lots of differences now in the polls that could shake things up. It will be a fascinating by election. But Emily, do you know why Scott Benton has to write to the Chancellor rather than the Prime Minister or the King in order to resign as an MP? Go on. It is because as a res there was a resolution of the House of Commons in the 1600s to say uh. that you're not allowed to resign as a Member of Parliament. It's a duty, not a privilege. And so it's a, it's a very solemn duty to be an MP. Mm. There is an exception, though. OK. If you take an office of the crown that gives you profit... Right. ..then you can't be an MP. That is, um, that, that's sort of counteracting your, your duties as an MP. So the only way to leave the House of Commons is to be appointed to an office of profit under the crown which the Chancellor of the Exchequer can appoint him to. And the two famous offices are the, uh, the Manor of Northstead and the Chiltern Hundreds. Translation? Translation, Scott Benton will either be appointed as the steward and bailiff of the Chiltern Hundreds or of the Manor of Northstead uh, and technically will then be holding an office of profit under the Crown and won't be able to be an MP and that's how he'll leave the House of Commons. Well, those of you at home will be testing you on that later, so I hope you were listening and making notes. Um, yeah, because I, I will obviously remember all of that. Well, it was Dating back to the 1600s. 1624. 1624. 1624 was the date at which it was decided you can't resign as an MP um, because, because it's a duty. Uh, and then what evolved from that was the, the weird process by which uh, members of parliament uh, resign. So I think uh, uh, Boris Johnson, for example, he took the Chiltern Hundreds uh, Nadine Dorries, I believe, took the manor of Northstead. But these are the two alternating offices mm. by which uh, members of Parliament Is it fair resign. to say that Scott Benton is stepping down in disgrace? 
I think that's fair. There yeah. was a pretty clear uh, assessment of what he did. It was a, a sting from the Sunday Times newspaper where he offered a fictional pro-gambling company uh, access to ministers and saying that he would raise what they wanted in Parliament for money. It was a pretty open and shut case. Yes, which, uh, funnily enough, is against the code of conduct. Yes. And so it should be. You can't be uh, lobbying or helping, uh, you know, particular groups get uh, mm. direct help from the government. No, and it is important to say he hasn't sat as a Conservative MP for quite a long time. He's been sitting as an independent. He had the whip removed when that report came out from the Standards Committee. Um, but now it seems that he has uh, uh, decided to, to leave his job and not stand. So there we again. go. You're going to be having another overnighter, perhaps. Uh, An when overnight that by election, election comes night here up, on GB News. Put that in your diary one. when we know that one. date. When we know that date, um, yeah. Tom will stay up all night for it, of course. And, and crucially, we'll find out whether he takes the Chiltern Hundreds or the Manor of Northstone. Well, quite. I can hardly <laughs> wait. Um, I can hardly contain my excitement. <laughs> but coming up, farmers are descending on the capital in protest against cheap food imports. Will it be like the scenes we've seen over on the continent? We'll be live on the ground after this very short break. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Yeah, well, when it comes to fish and chips, we all know they're a part of a British tradition and the Golden Chippy is, is an award-winning uh, restaurant and for years they've been serving the community here in Greenwich and even today on a Sunday they are fully packed today but this is the issue here we've got a mural and which says a great British meal residents who live in this area who've complained uh, to Greenwich Council who say it's inappropriate uh, considering it's in a conservation area here's what some of the local people we've been speaking to had to say What's wrong with it? It looks all right, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Look at some of the other they've got around in Greenwich. They don't want to take that down, do they? But when you've got something like this, it's half day, so they want to remove it. Fantastic artwork. I really like it. Reminds me of Banksy. Well, those are the views here from people who live in this local area. But I'm kindly joined by Chris, the owner. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. You've been here for 20 years now. Um, tell, tell me how this issue has come up. They take pictures. It's only been up for about a month. And uh, it's been very, very popular. I don't want to believe that any of the locals are uh, complaining that this is uh, too loud or anything like that. They say it's, it needs planning permission. How a little thing like this needs planning permission, I don't know. Are you working with an artist in this local area? I've got a local uh, guy that uh, does uh, murals. So he said, uh, would you like me to do something for you? I said, yes, why not? I said, make sure you leave a bit of space for people to stand there so they can uh, take some selfies or pictures or whatever they want to do from Golden Chippy. And it's been extremely popular. And not one person has come to me and said, that looks terrible. So I cannot imagine the person that complained about this. I think it's just cancelled. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, eight till nine on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free.
Good afternoon, Britain. It's coming up to 10 to 3. And following months of protest... May I just say, UK... Tom has been um, educating me with his wisdom <laughs> about the 1600s and all of the technicalities from within the Westminster Palace. Well, we were, just, we were just during the break looking up uh, the office holders of the uh, Crown Student Here Bailey again. the Chiltern Hundreds <laughs> and the Manor of Northstead. Uh, and it's obviously all of the MPs who've resigned. Um, so, uh, the Chiltern Hundreds were held by Boris Johnson, Nadine Dorries, Chris Skidmore, those were the last three. Yeah. Um, but the Manor of Northstead, uh, the most... The, the incumbent holder of it is Chris Pincher. So, I imagine ones. that this one will go to Benton, because they alternate in terms of... Right. But before then, it was David Warburton and Nigel Adams, N Neil Parrish... You don't really want to find yourself on that Wikipedia page, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. No, there, there are lots of people who've just resigned. So, for example, Heidi Alexander once held it when she resigned to go and become a deputy mayor of London. Oh, OK. So, it's not all so people it's, who it's have resigned all... because of bad... Reasons. No, no, it's just it's it, for any reason resigning from the House of Commons, you have to take one of these offices that is then in contravention of your obligations as an MP, and that's how you get out the House of Commons. Well, there you go. But uh, following months of protests across the UK and the continent, farmers are today descending on London, descending on the capital to protest against cheap food imports and to call on the government to protect high British food standards in any future trade deals. Well, this comes as farmers are warning the UK could soon experience a shortage of vegetables and grains as more and more farmland is being taken over for environmental schemes. Remember when Therese Coffee was telling us all to uh, eat turnips? <laughs> I wonder if there's a shortage. That was, that was, that was a bit of co political communication, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Let them eat turnips. Well... Uh, anyway, let's get more on this with GB News national reporter Theo Jacomba. Theo, what is the scale of this protest? Yeah, well, we're expecting around 200 farmers to come into central London just a few moments ago, actually. We saw uh, one tractor just uh, go past me uh, just over my right shoulder here um, at the new Covent Garden Market in southwest London. And they're all going to be heading towards Westminster just after five o'clock. Um, but their argument is against uh, low food imports coming from other parts of the world. And they're also talking about um, the subsidies that the government is using at the moment, encouraging farmers to focus on wildlife uh, rather than food production, which is having an impact, particularly on prices that we've seen uh, here in the supermarkets. But I'm kindly joined this afternoon by um, Julie and Carol. Thank you so much. You've come all the way from Cheshire. Um, so just tell me, first of all, um, why you're here today. Well, I'm here from Cheshire because um, to represent some farmers that aren't able to uh, attend. I know them personally and I know they haven't been uh, supported by DEFRA. In fact, the opposite seems to be happening. Um, so I'm just here to um, raise their awareness for the people of the UK that our food supply could be in real serious jeopardy because it's reported that 49% of them won't exist after this year if some support isn't given to them. And what else are your friends telling you at the moment? Uh, well, they're reneging, uh, the supermarkets are in, uh, they're growing food and then they're reneging on contracts and so they've got all the food ready and then they're, they're not able to, uh, to get paid for it. Um, so as I say, 49, as I understand it, 49% of farmers are considering um, quitting and there was a protest in Wales where every farmer that was thinking to, um, that they were going to have to give up their businesses, they don't want to, um, but they left a Wellington on, at the Senate and, um, and there were thousands of Wellingtons left there for every farmer that would have to quit their farms. And if we have no farmers, we have no food. So that puts our, our food supply in, in jeopardy. Thank you so much. And on to you. Um, how important is British farming? Well, I think it's important that we support our farmers across the UK um, because, you know, one thing that they, they farm the best, best food in, in the world, the standards are the highest, and, you know, they're under threat, as, as Carol said, and, um, you know, that we continue to have the choice where we have our food from. 
and um, you know I, I live in a, a small village in in Cheshire and we support our local farms locally we buy food locally and that's important again for our carbon footprint and you know obviously they were going to lose that and we don't know where our food will be coming from in the future and and what standard it, it, it is we know we're in control of the standard in this country and you know our, our politicians are, are accountable for the the quality of the food in this country and we want to keep it like that brilliant thank you so much uh, for your time and for traveling all the way down from cheshire here Pleasure. to london talking of politicians uh, just just to bring you this uh, farming minister mark spencer is in support and he says we firmly back our farmers british farming is at the heart of british trade and we put agriculture mm. at the forefront of any deals we negotiate prioritizing new export opportunities protecting uk food standards and removing market access barriers so that's the message they'll be trying to drive home this afternoon here in London. Very important message there, of course. Trade is two ways. Trade deals can often also offer these great export opportunities for our farmers as well as imports. Theodore Chicomba, thank you for joining us. Yes, the government should just make it as easy as possible for our farmers to turn a profit and to be able to, to farm turn, the turn land. Turn it profit. Turn it. Turn a prop. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure Theo is going to be uh, bringing updates for mm. Martin. If more of those tractors yes. come along, I wanted to oh, see the it tractors. It would be great to see the tractors coming down the London roads. But that's it for us today. Martin is up next. Next, and what's coming up on your show? Yeah, guys, thank you for um, putting me over. When those farmers roll into Westminster, we'll be right on the front line talking to them. Also, three years on from the Batley Grammar School teacher being forced into hiding, new anti-protest laws are out. Are they enough to stop this? We'll speak to one of the people closest to the teacher with an exclusive update on how he is getting along. A nightmare on Downing Street, another by-election for Rishi Sunak, this time Scott Benton in Blackpool. Shamima Begum loses again. Yes, I know, get the smallest violins out. And also, um, a council is fleecing SUVs on parking charges. Is that coming to a town near you? The war on motorists continues. All that, three till six. But first, here's your latest weather forecast. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Welcome along to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. More wet weather to come throughout this week, really. Not too much today across parts of East Anglia and the southeast, but it is a pretty chilly start to the working week. Low pressure sitting just to the west of the UK, as it will be for the next several days. Weather fronts pushing northwards. Far northwest of Scotland, seeing some bright or even sunny spells. And as I mentioned, much of East Anglia and the southeast dry. But everywhere, it's drab, it's damp. And it's fairly breezy as well. Some heavy bursts of rain across the southwest and the wet weather turning to snow over the hills across eastern Scotland. Temperatures here really struggling, six, seven degrees at best. Further south, we might get to double digits, maybe 11 or 12 with a bit of brightness in the southeast, but still fairly chilly for the time of year. And it's going to be really cold rain in eastern Scotland this evening. We'll see more snow over the hills. That could cause some problems on the highest routes, the A9, for example, seeing some heavy snow for a time through the night. Elsewhere, the rain will tend to ease across a good chunk of England and Wales. Temperatures will fall down to single figures, uh, but generally a dry start for many on Tuesday. Still pretty cloudy and there is more rain to come, more snow to come for eastern Scotland, with chiefly rain at lower levels, but this zone of wet weather then works back across parts of the Midlands into Wales and across southeast England, so a much wetter day here. Something a bit brighter for South Wales and southwest England, but still, although we may get to double digits,